We've entered the endgame, people. Avengers Endgame Movie Review. Welcome back, fellow Defenders. We're here with our discussion about Avengers Endgame, the 22nd movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And this is episode 222 of Defenders TV Podcast. Did we plan that? Yes. 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 A hundred percent. It's been 10 years in the making mm-hmm. for this film and also for us to land right on this number. Yeah. We're behind about uh, about three or four episodes on our coverage of Doctor Strange. That's because we were saving this number for the uh, 22nd movie in the MCU. Uh, welcome back, fellow defenders. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hi, I'm one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out the group, it is I, Chris. Welcome back, Chris. Welcome back, John. It's nice to yes, be recording. We exactly. haven't actually recorded much since the last time we did uh, our Captain Marvel movie review. We've done one Doctor Strange uh, comic book cover. Uh, and we've done well, lots of Gotham because Gotham, our other show on Gotham TV podcast, has just finished this week. So uh, we've been recording a Gotham episode uh, every once in a while. Yes, too. indeed. And welcome back, fellow defenders. Uh, we've, we've missed you. Yes, we, we with the, the lack of Marvel Netflix stuff, um, then I suppose we were last interacting with Captain Marvel, our movie review, and then we have done A Strange Tale since then. So, mm-hmm. yes, it's good to be back. Good to be back. I will just point out, it's only been like a month. That's true. Very soon we will be at a time where it's like, yeah, about once a month we're going to get some far- form of Marvel property. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's been so long. And you're like, no, no, not really. <laughs> Remember there was years where it was like we'd go two, three years without a comic book film? Nope. I don't remember no. that. Does anybody else remember that? That's, that's a yeah, long yeah. time ago, Edgar. <laughs> I think that was back in 89. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, it feels like that anyway. Um, no, I suppose definitely over the course of our time podcasting, we have yes. had those times where we've been three or four months between episodes because we were just doing TV shows. But I don't think we've gone that, that much uh, it's such a long time we've been the shows on the Netflix shows we're kind of backing into each other we were finishing one as a new one was being released you know a week later or a movie was coming out or something like that so I think the pace has slowed down quite considerably because we're coming up to our last Netflix show uh, which is Jessica Jones coming out sometime later this year still no announcements still no photographs still no promotion at all for that uh, final series on Netflix but once it comes out we will still be recovering it yes. here on Defenders TV Podcast absolutely I'm, I'm really looking forward to Jessica Jones uh, season 3 mm-hmm. uh, to the same degree I think as I was looking forward to this movie as well it's Ooh. great to finally have the end game to discuss mm-hmm. for sure And if you haven't heard a podcast from us in a little while, it's very good to remind you that uh, as Defenders is is coming to the end, we will be moving to our probably a bit bit broader category of podcasts, which is TV podcast industries, where we discuss anything really to do with TV. Uh, We discuss different stuff, not just Marvel, not just DC. We'll be covering other TV shows. Yes, Uh, indeed. Our first outing there will be Good Omens, the Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman adaptation of... uh, the omen uh, effectively and and damien and all that but yes. good omens so uh, and if you haven't seen the recent youtube clip of all the evil nuns who raise uh, damien then uh, for sure you have to check it out it <laughs> is completely python-esque and yes. is very very funny and has a little cameo of uh, neil gaiman himself yes that's the chattering order of beryl yes <laughs> fantastic really looking forward to it he He's not the son of the devil. He's just a very naughty boy. <laughs> it's very similar. It it's is very similar. really. I have to check really. that out once we're finished up this. But yes, if you want to follow all of the covers that, we, that we'll be doing, go over to tvpodcastindustries.com. We have all of our podcasts that we've released so far all categorized over there. And you can subscribe to the podcast there and you'll get everything that we're talking about as we go into the rest of our future as TV podcasts. Exactly, fellow Defenders. Defenders still exists it's just over on tv podcast industries We've just moved it over um, to a, another platform so that we can cover other stuff as well as the marvel uh, and uh, well i suppose any marvel kind of property in the same as we've done for gotham as well exactly exactly right boys i think we need to get into this Ooh. before we do the one thing that i kept hearing about over and over again before this movie was coming out was how long it was it's uh, just over three hours uh, for avengers endgame we will be going to our spoiler filled thoughts but 
lots of people in the US asking for a, an intermission to come into the movie. Um, if you've listened to some of our recent podcasts about movies over here in Switzerland, uh, we get an intermission in our movies. We do. Every movie, we want to or not. Well, except at Pathé Cinemas, but at Kitag Cinemas, you get an intermission. And we got one for uh, Endgame. We got... Free purrs were handed out for some <laughs> reason. Um, very healthy here uh, mm-hmm. in Switzerland. Hold on, what pears? Yes. Like pears. Not pears of things, actual like An actual fruit. fruit, the fruit pear. Uh, and okay. then a lot of people were going and getting pears of like popcorn and chocolate and nachos <laughs> and stuff. But yeah. if you wanted to go healthy, you could, but it was free to take during the intermission. But that wasn't really the reason why I was saying this at all. It had nothing to do with the pears. I just wanted to point no, out... No, we're focusing on the pears. <laughs> Screw Endgame and the intermission. I wanted to know about the pears. <laughs> I just wanted to say for all of our fellow defenders who may have been interested in having an intermission, it absolutely destroyed the run of the film. Coming up to the movie, uh, the Russos were asked if they were to have an intermission, when roughly would they think it, they, you could put it in? And they said, no, where the film's made as it is. It's made to be a, a movie that you sit through for three hours and i absolutely believe that's the case at least in our cinema they chose the completely wrong place to put it in they put it in roughly uh, about an hour and 20 minutes into the movie where everybody is reeling from the fact they can't uh, solve this problem it just about brings in a little bit of hope for the characters and then a cut to a 15 minute break where everybody was sitting around staring at a blank screen uh, for that 15 minutes exactly the point when you want the film to cheer you up a bit and to drive towards a, a conclusion so I I would veto an, an intermission next time, I think. Yes, no toilet breaks during this three-hour movie. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it's, uh, here in Ireland we didn't get one, and I'm kind of glad. Um, this film was set to be viewed in one large chunk. And let's be, let's be honest, if your bladder can't handle just a whole three hours without a bathroom break, you've got to get good. Just train. <laughs> you train before. It's like a marathon. Just go before, like, you know. Um, but no, seriously, it's, it, it, we didn't have one and I, I was fine. I, I knew going in, so. Yeah, and we're, we're survivors of the uh, extended editions of Lord of the Rings in the cinema as well. So they run at about three and a half hours to four hours anyway. So uh, no big skin off your nose. No. Yeah, absolutely. But Derek, on to the movie details. Enough about pairs, enough about intermissions. What did the movie give us <laughs> well not really too much information additionally for this movie uh, once again comes from the russo brothers who uh, directed winter soldier civil war infinity war uh, they also were originally directors back in the day on uh, the tv show community you may have noticed a couple of cameos again from actors who were on the tv show community we'll talk about those a little bit later on but the movie was written by christopher marcus and steve mcfeely once again who've written all of those movies with the russos and they also created agent carter who probably has my favorite cameo within the movie yeah, thing. she featured uh, really nicely in uh, in this movie, so mm-hmm. it was good to see old uh, Peggy Carter back on the screen for sure. And Jarvis, the first character to go from a TV show into a movie. Yes. There you go. Well, John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for the movie? Sure. After the devastating events of Thanos' snap, the remaining Avengers, along with Captain Marvel, go after Thanos... But despite Thor's vengeance, the universe remains in ruins and the deep loss of friends persists. But an unexpected visit to Avengers HQ from Ant-Man offers new hope of a time travel plan B to reverse the snap. With the help of the remaining allies, a reluctant Iron Man and Captain America put aside their differences and the Avengers assemble once more in order to undo Thanos' actions. As they go on the hunt for the Infinity Gems to restore order to the universe, Thanos becomes aware of this threat against his mission by torturing Nebula. As he arrives on Earth with the Black Order to destroy the Avengers, the forces collected against him come together in an epic battle for the fate of the universe. Nice. There is so much going on in this film. This is the biggest film to date in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Fellow Defenders, there is no way we're going to be able to cover the whole thing, but we're going to try. We're going to, we've cut it into our usual top five points uh, to discuss the, the movie itself. Hopefully we'll do our best to cover it, but we will miss some things. We've got some feedback that will cover some other things later on, but let's get into our top five points. Yes, it is our spoiler filled from here on out. And so point number one, plan A, failure. Mm. Well, they didn't actually plan for failure. 
I think we <laughs> No, they didn't. They didn't. It failed to give them that warm, fuzzy feeling because the uh, the killing of Thanos didn't quite uh, make up for the huge void of death and uh, grief, yeah. I mm-hmm. suppose, ultimately. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because since in the year since Infinity War was released, you, you've had every type of theory about what's going to happen and how the movie's going to resolve. We talked about it when we discussed originally Infinity War that the plan can't be go and beat up Thanos because, well, everything's already happened. So you can't just beat him up and kill him because there's nothing that, that will accomplish other than killing Thanos. And that's exactly what's happened here. So I'm really glad they put this this moment in where we have Captain Marvel coming in, bringing Tony and Nebula back from their imminent death. Well, at least Tony's imminent death. I think Nebula would have survived. <laughs> so quick question on this. How did mm-hmm. um, Carol find them? That, that That's just not explained, that part. It's the, the, he doesn't say, we put an SOS out. He doesn't say anything like that. Tony is sending those messages, though. Um, and he's he's hoping that they're going to be picked up and relayed to Earth, and Carol picks them up. So what we find out from Carol is that she is uh, she is going around the universe solving problems. That's what she's been doing since the end of Captain Marvel. So um, she is on the constant lookout for people in distress and finds Tony by that way. I think I think you're right. It's not specifically laid out, but that's the only thing that kind of carries over from okay. that Marvel movie is that she's been going around the universe solving issues, and she most likely was close enough to be able to hear Tony's distress speaking. Yeah, I think back on Earth, she does say um, it's not just this planet that's got problems, and they don't have the Avengers to, mm-hmm. to help them out. So she is the Avengers for the rest of the universe, basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, in that sense. A, a one-man Avenger, or one-woman Avenger, yeah. I should say. No, and I look, so I like the introduction. It can be feel, felt that she filmed this first before the Captain Marvel film. Mm-hmm. Because I ju- literally, mm-hmm. I only reason I say that is the Captain Marvel film. It feels like Brie Larson has really found the character of Carol Danvers, okay. where I think at the very beginning of this film they mm-hmm. hadn't. The, I just okay. I, it, it, it was just weird. It was just she was a bit more self smug, if that's if if that's even a word of a descriptor, <laughs> smug, <laughs> and I don't know. It was just I. I liked Captain Marvel. I mm-hmm. didn't like Captain Marvel in this first opening scenes. Right. Um, okay. Anyway, okay. jumping on. Yeah, I think she'd certainly got her um, confidence uh, for Absolutely. sure. Like she felt very sure of herself yeah. and, and was very confident. But I think that was quite nice because ultimately, you know, she didn't she didn't allow for any kind of back chat from Iron Man and she wasn't mm-hmm. really necessarily going to take lessons from Thor or other people. And, you know, there, there is this kind of mutual suspicion, which I quite like from, um, the black widow uh, and, and even with, with Thor about, well, who is this, this, this lady mm-hmm. that that's brought Tony and, and Nebula back. And, and I, I thought that was quite nice. And, and you get that, you know, that scene that was in the trailer where um, Stormbreaker is called by Thor as it, you know, whistles past uh, her ears and she doesn't mm-hmm. flinch. And he, and then, you know, he's kind of cool with her after yeah. that. So that that was kind of quite nice. Um, I really liked as well, I think like you said, uh, Chris, I, I really like this opening with Iron Man and, and Nebula. I think it really um, informs how then Iron Man... Uh, moves forward once he's back on earth which yeah. is again at slight odds with captain america and I, I liked um that he is kind of right i'm retiring we tried everything we you know we used we threw everything at thanos including the toaster and it didn't work <laughs> and um I, I thought that was really nice you know and he's in his darkest moment he thinks he's going to die they're running out of food water fuel all this kind of stuff and mm-hmm. um, yeah. and uh you know yeah saved by marvel but even with that sort of um last minute save he's kind of he decides to focus on himself and his family rather than um i suppose what's left of the avengers yeah. uh, and to uh, sort of maybe dwell on, on, on those things even though they're s- still painful for him so i i quite like that because i think it really informed how iron man behaves in in this kind of first half of the movie yeah he really does exactly what thanos has wanted them to do which is just accept that you lost accept yes. that you lost and move on you've lost 
but there's still a ha- there's still half of every single species in every single universe is still alive. So accept it and move on, which is exactly what Tony does. I have to say they did a great job with Tony Stark coming back from, from space as well. He looked like he really had shrank down quite a lot. His body looked, looked really tired. And yeah. Really, really well done. Wasn't uh, it, really, though? really well put together. A lovely touch as well. That is Captain Marvel carrying the ship back on her shoulders. The way she left at the end of, uh, of Captain Marvel was pushing a ship out of the out of uh, the solar system and she's coming back into the solar system with another ship on her back a lovely little touch there um i i i love there's one line that's completely sticking with me throughout this uh, opening um part which is where tony turns around to cap and goes well that's what we are we're the avengers yes we always come after the fact but where were you at the beginning Mm -hmm. and that for me completely encapsulates this this uh this part this point mm-hmm. which yeah. is this is too late yeah like they are too late they are just going for revenge the revengers or the avengers yeah now. That's, that's it and tony's the only one who sees sees that at this point and he's like but wasn't that his it wasn't that his introduction to loki of who they were were originally back in the original avengers movie he says we are the avengers and if we if we don't win, you're damn sure we're going to avenge the Earth, right? Yes. So effectively, he did. Name, he, he has come up with a name for them. He has given them that and, ha- and does agree that that's what they are. But he just believes that's not enough anymore, I suppose. It's great to have this moment with Tony where he steps away, where he's saying, I'm just going to go on. I'm going to get on with my life. I can't do any more. He's gone through all of the emotions being out in space, sending these messages to Pepper saying he wants to make it back, but doesn't think he's going to be able to. So he's gone through all of those motions of giving up on his family and miraculously he's been brought back so he doesn't want to give it up again. It's a a really nice motif for the start of the movie. And I really feel this first 22 films is the Tony Stark arc. Mm. It is the character's growth, death, rebirth, everything in between. I'll I'll say Tony and Cap. Yeah, no, 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 hold on. Cap Cap gets his own, but it, like, and Cap is definitely... I, I'd say the reason I say Tony Tony is more because we're just talking about him right now yeah. is but yeah. he does have slightly more um, growth and stuff like that. But Cap is a cl- a, a, a close second, like mm-hmm. like they're nipping at each other's heel, which we'll discuss why definitely. later on. I, I agree with you definitely, and I, I do like that the the events of Civil War are still playing out between Tony and Steve. They still don't really see eye to eye, or at the very least, Tony still really hurt about what happened between the two of them until much later on in the film. Uh, I like this opening here. You can still feel that Tony's been stewing on not wanting to speak to Steve and waiting for an apology from him, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I I, th- I think it's interesting that he doesn't go to uh, Thanos' home world mm-hmm. uh, when when they make this uh, recce to, to bring him back because ultimately um, what we find out is that he's clicked his fingers again kind of thing but Mm -hmm. this time to destroy all the stones he's done his mission you know he is this prophet of malthusian doom and he's done it and um and so he's destroying all the stones because um it you know this pure missionary kind of way um he doesn't want to be tempted uh but to to use them for other purposes after this it was a a, a one time uh snap for him yeah. and uh i i like how um they all kind of come together here i mean you really do kind of get the sense of captain marvel's power uh here as being the game changer as to why they can all kind of even though they work together that they um you know, to, can kind of subdue him to the point. But, you know, Thor as well, knowing how, um, you know, that that killing of, of Loki, the murder of Loki, the murder of Heimdall as well, is still really very much uh, on his mind. And the fact that he didn't avenge them uh, because he should have gone for the head. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, he certainly goes for the, the head there with a good kind of swing uh, with his with his axe, for sure. That was the first big reaction from our audience, actually, which I was really surprised about. The laughter after Thor lops off the head the head of Thanos really surprised me because I didn't think it was played for laughs. I think it was genuinely him going, if I'd just done this last time, that entire universe would have been saved. This time I'm not I'm not 
doing anything other than chopping off your head, basically. Yeah, I don't think it was supposed to be played for laughs, yeah. to be honest. But yeah, it, it was weirdly found uh, amusing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dark sense of humor, the Swiss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Careful. Um, you're a neutral country. Um, That's true. <laughs> Hopefully they don't yes, deport us. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry, Switzerland government. Um, no, uh, for me, that, that got a smile, personally. It was mm-hmm. like it wasn't a giggle. It was more of a okay. He's getting his like he he did what he was supposed to do. Um, this is where just just so you know, this is the first crinkle in what I've actually have in this film. In that Thanos destroying the gems uh, or the stones, I should mm-hmm. based on what the ancient one says later on. He shouldn't be able to do that uh-huh. because she says. You you can't get rid of the the stones. They are part of the fabric of the universe. Um, so he shouldn't be able to use the stones to, to destroy the stones. Yeah, true. I do wonder. I do wonder had there ever been a moment when they were all united before Thanos? Because in in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, anyway, it feels like they were created, cast to every corner of the universe. And if they were all united together, then we will see how drastic and horrible that power is going to be. So I don't know whether anybody has any kind of playbook is exactly what would happen when they come back together. Um, but you can see the toll that it's taken on Thanos. And I suppose that's part of the part of the story of the whole film, really, is that Thanos is, a, yeah. is completely broken here. And then they beat him more and then kill him. Um, but really, he'd already done the major damage to himself. He looks like he was on his last legs, really, when they arrived because half of his body was burnt up by trying That's to destroy true. these stones yeah. with the other stones. So so you kind of get that, that impression that maybe because it was Thanos wielding the stones and using the stones to destroy them, maybe nobody else in the universe would have been able to do that because they, they aren't as powerful as, him, as he is without the stones, if that makes sense. When you start saying fabric of the universe and you can't do this, mm-hmm. this, later on you're like, yeah. what they just yeah. did? Like earlier, well, in your past, but, but, in your future. I mean, um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, but but Wong and Stephen Strange talk about that they were created in the sort of the fire of the Big Bang and mm-hmm. and and all that kind of stuff. So, in in a sense, what is it? You know, he's destroyed them, but their energy can still persist in terms yeah. of that, like in the fabric of the universe, or you know, whatever. So mm-hmm. It may have just been transmitted, but physically, the stones are are, are no longer there. But right. somehow, maybe their energy is transformed into something else, uh, to to a realm or, or what have you. Because mm-hmm. yeah, what what happens to the soul realm when you destroy the soul stone? Like, is that something that? is significant. I mean, we don't know. It's not been mentioned, but uh, yeah, I, I know it what you're saying, Chris, for sure. Um, and, and, and I, and I in a, yeah. uh, basically, I'm saying this because basically this film is like my hotel bed. It's perfectly crisp. It's beautiful. It's like got the little flower petals and like that origami swan made out of towels. It's perfect. <laughs> but there's just little, little wrinkles that don't ruin anything that do not destroy anything, yeah. that just make me go, hmm. Well, you put a lot of details into this part of the pillow, but you miss this wrinkle here. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the best <laughs> the best analogy I can give. There's the, as we go through <laughs> this, I'm like, here's another tiny little wrinkle. It doesn't destroy anything. It's perfect. Uh, but, like, it's just, I noticed it. Let's see, because what I do think is that McFeely and Marcus have constructed a film that pulls from all yes. 21 other movies and answers questions that people thought were you know going to trip them up when they got to this movie. They answer so many things that people thought about after watching Infinity War. And this movie was made before anybody in the world had their opportunity to comment on Infinity War. They'd finished the filming of it. So, so this was none of these are here to serve fan questions yeah. or answer any fan questions or theories. This was all out there and done by the time everybody had their theories about Infinity War and everybody had their theories about how things were written. I wonder if things like that from the ancient one, there was a question that I had for John actually about that. I wonder if things like that are set up for to be answered in future films because this is only the end of Phase 3. We have another Spider-Man movie coming in a couple of months' time. We have a Doctor Strange movie, the second one coming in a couple of years' time. We've got Black, Black Panther, Panther 2. 2. So there are some little things the that Eternals. are being pulled 
left here, I suppose, that can be picked up in other movies in the future. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think um, on to point number two, mm-hmm. because I think the the interesting thing about with Thanos' head being lopped off is that you see, you know, in Captain Marvel, in Captain America, and most people there, that they also didn't as such want for Thanos's head to be lopped off by Thor. And mm-hmm. like he basically comes in well, all elbows and, and, and arms barging away to, to do that because it, it feels um, that it's his right. And I think, you know, our point too, five years later, is that the death of Thanos has not helped anyone out. And mm-hmm. they still have these people missing from their lives. Society um, is still maybe... Um, on, on a flat line as a result of what's happened. Right. Um, and uh, they're all trying to cope uh, in differing ways with their, their loss. I mean, you know, we have Clint there traveling the world as Ronan effectively murdering unworthy people. And I think that's a really interesting response to that opening of this movie which was really poignant you know we didn't see clint in the first film and then you just have that family uh picnic uh by their farm uh, and all of a sudden was his daughter who he's been um practicing you know bow and arrow with and then he looks across and his wife and the other kids has has gone as well have been turned to dust and it was just really neatly done Mm -hmm. but he goes you know he just he has his own snap uh, and decides to go off killing people because why would they survive these people who are murderers and corrupt when his you know innocent family uh died in, in that snap so i thought that was really interesting and i mean you know for laughs i did quite like uh how thor had descended into effectively dad what, bud well it was kind of like me at university uh drink beer uh play games um and yeah be quite wait, wait, did you grow your hair out and have a massive beard i want to see that uh, I had a massive beer yeah. belly, probably. Um, <laughs> I, I can't grow. I can't grow facial hair. If I do, yeah. I end up looking like a, a Mexican army general. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty terrible. It is pretty terrible. But here's another answer to another question that people had: What happened to Korg, Miek, and the other members of of the Asgardians that were that were still alive yeah. at the end of at the end of uh, Infinity War? We know now they they all wound up on Earth. We have new Asgard on Earth, a, a really good storyline uh, taken from the comic books. But this time it's with a an unresponsive Thor at the heart of it and Valkyrie kind of directing everything going on while he does nothing other than drink and as you say play uh, play Fortnite with Corgan Miak back at back at home as if he's uh, <laughs> as if he's a student again you know I do love that in 2024 Fortnite is still the biggest game <laughs> it's just like <laughs> yeah, oh, no, nothing's overtaken it just yet exactly exactly um once again, I, it would be remiss of me to say, once again, I do think that the tone of Thor is very, very shoehorned into this movie. Um, it does feel like you're, like you've flipped the channel onto some comedy show, um, especially during these scenes, which is everybody mourning the loss of everything that's going on. When you have the comedy that's going on in the background of the Thor scenes, it just feels a little bit out of place. I think that's probably the reason why you had... Bruce Banner and Rocket Raccoon going to meet Thor rather than one of the other characters so they could have a comedy scene in the middle of it. But yes, he's going through mourning. He's going through obviously a terrible experience. Um, so totally understand why he's gone this bad. But it felt that the tone of it just felt a little bit off for me. But that's just me. <laughs> so I much preferred the stoic Thor post um literally post the snapping in the plan a failure mm-hmm. where it's like tony goes what's wrong with him he lost everything and like they yeah. should have had it there i i liked I, yeah. it was funny to see the fat uh alcoholic <laughs> thor but yeah. like literally it was almost they played way too into that throughout the film yeah yeah I felt really sorry for all the ladies and guys that go to the theatre to watch Chris Hemsworth take off his shirt because they've been doing it right the way back to his first appearance that there is a moment in every single movie where he takes his shirt off and shows those amazing the hem- the abs, hem- the the impossible abs. abs that Chris Hemsworth has. I do feel really sorry for all the people that expected to see that again in this movie and got that, <laughs> well, that bad. Well, when but he- I feel really happy for him. Uh, yeah, it, it <laughs> was. He's a yeah. human avenger. He's got the dad. Exactly. Yeah. 
There was a lot of screams in the audience where and <laughs> like laughing screams mm-hmm. as, you know, the um the six pack made way for the keg. Um it was hilarious and I did really like that. I, I agree. I think it was slightly hammed up, slightly yeah. overdone. Um it, it overdone in the sense that it, it went on for too long through the movie and, and even I mean I, I didn't quite like Korg even in Thor Ragnarok. True. Um and to have that happening um just because it was so serious everywhere else this seemed at odds with what had just happened yeah. and on Thanos's homeworld but i did enjoy the the laughs i think it could almost have been you know this sort of like separate 10 minute kind of jokey footage on youtube that yes. marvel puts out or something yeah. it, it it felt like it could have been that whether it worked in the movie i'm not entirely sure but i did find it funny um and you know i i still had to sort of weigh up whether i thought it was too hammy or overdone because i did like it yeah. i did enjoy it for sure like so i i like the fact that they show he he, he let himself go right he became more like force mm-hmm. look first act yes yes the best one of the, the nicest touches i will say about this with the long hair and the beard is later on when like when they're going for everything crazy he when he calls Minor and or Monier. What is it? Monier? Meow meow. Meow, meow meow. When he calls Meow Meow, meow, meow. and Stormbreaker, um, his, his beard braids and his hair braids. Absolutely. Yep. And he, and he loses the gut as well. Yeah. Well, he doesn't completely lose it. His just arm reforms a bit more on top of it. <laughs> oh, it's like Which one of I those found, vests that it's, form it's basically, pecs. And... It basically, he got a fake vest with pecs. <laughs> he got a corset. It was almost like a corset. Yeah. It just kind of sucked things in. Um, they don't work, I, do they, I, unless they're made out of cast iron? Well, I think this one was. Yeah. It has guardian cast iron <laughs> forged by the dwarves of Meow Meow. Yes, you, you may call uh, it magic, but they have uh, they have proper science on Asgard. That but I call it, it strong elastic corsets. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, I, I personally think like it was a funny moment, and I actually agree with you. They could have done the, the Korg scene slightly off screen off uh, on youtube or streaming apps or as a dvd extra etc or blu-ray extra I should say um but i think they should have basically like they should have left like you had basically then it would have been good to see rocket and hulk leave and then korg or someone someone saying something to thor him arriving later maybe like yeah. literally like a week later and he's back i think to- i think what you can feel here is that obviously talk about he plays the character of korg you can feel that he probably managed this scene and probably directed this scene like as if it was something out of ragnarok um yes that's what it felt like i didn't like ragnarok I, I, it's probably my least favorite of the movies and we talked about that back on the ragnarok podcast why it was because it's a comedy movie and i don't really like that type of comedy but that's why it didn't work for me, but I know there are a ton of people that Ragnarok is their absolute favorite MCU movie. And if you put Thor in this movie and they come along and see Stoic Thor once again, they'll be going, well, hang on a second. Nobody liked those first two movies. Why did you bring back Stoic Thor and not our comedy Thor again? So it's necessary to be there. Personally, just didn't like it, but it's only there for a short amount of time. Hey, give the give the Ragnarok fans their uh, their due. They made that movie uh, pretty big um, with the at the yeah. cinema in the box office. So there's loads more of them than there is than there is of me, definitely. But there's loads of other characters that have made big changes, I suppose, over the over the years. I thought it was quite interesting that Steve Rogers has taken on that idea of being a mentor to other people, um, similar to the way the way he met Falcon back in uh, the, his first meeting of uh, with him back in Winter Soldier. We have Steve giving guidance to people trying to cope with their losses, and effectively, he comes from the only place to be able to do that because well effectively he was asleep for 50 60 years and lost every yeah. single thing that that he loved and has been able to overcome that and live and create a life for himself so he's trying to help other people in the city and in in the world to manage their lives now that they've lost everything so yeah i thought that was a good a good touch i think it's interesting i was kind of quite surprised how little the world had managed to pull itself back mm. together yeah um like that all of a sudden you'd have these kind of uh you know shanty ship uh, city uh, forming around the Statue of Liberty, mm-hmm. um, and, and certainly given the the idea that all the other uh, uh, you know Avenger movies and that it's all about you know being able to to keep going, uh, be pushed through it, and, and to to do your best. And it felt like they weren't even accepting their own advice from the, <laughs> from the previous movies, yeah. and it was just like I uh, just can't go on. I get that as well, but mm-hmm. it felt a little weird that no one 
has globally stepped up to like you know keep things going and it it felt like it just flatlined or you know it was like when ant-man was walking through the old neighborhood and then mm. it was that ramshackled i mean would that be the case would the bins still be being collected kind of thing i, I don't know it, it seemed maybe um it, it, that maybe it was taken a little too far this idea that it was almost a bit like a zombie apocalypse kind of thing but um it was interesting to see that that was the take, I think, that it was a collective, like, we just can't go on yeah. uh, and we can't move forward uh, at all. Although I did like with Natasha then leading the Avengers and trying mm. to maintain um, that kind of shield or world order, um, you know, so to keep that normalcy going was really kind of interesting as well uh, with Captain Marvel, War Machine, Rocket and uh, Achaia. Um which I did think it was quite good when she says, yeah, I, you know, two years ago, I wouldn't have been speaking with a raccoon or yeah. something. Really, <laughs> like, really good stuff. Yeah. yeah, no, it's really interesting because we do have the Avengers uh, being led by Natasha here. It feels like Steve even has stepped back a little bit from that role and Natasha's kind of taken that on as her as her role. I love the arc of Natasha in the movie as she is effectively saying, you know, I never really had anybody before and now I have a family and now I have people to manage and help and, and we're we're out working together to keep this world on track. You know, it, it, that's, that's kind of it. I suppose what they're trying to do in shorthand in the movie is say, you know, society there in America has 60, what, 64 million people and they've just snapped 32 million of them out of existence. So yeah. it's going to be quite difficult to do things like have, you know, they, they show a stadium where American football is being played. And of course, you're not going to have huge crowds going to American football if half of the population disappear all of a sudden you've lost so much of society you know um i loved that moment with paul rudd's returning um from the quantum realm as he's walking through his old neighborhood and looking at a kid going by gone what happened here like everything has just yeah. broken down in san francisco yeah uh, that's really interesting can i ask you a question mm -hmm. so uh one of the easter eggs that i, I kind of want to call out during cops support group mm -hmm. is that joe russo is that's the right. guy talking that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's his. And he'd previously been in Winter Soldier as the surgeon. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we don't know if this is the same character or not the same character. Yeah. The cameo is the first openly gay character in the MCU after that's 20 right. films. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And it's a really emotional moment. Um, yeah. Interesting that, that it is the director that's playing this really emotional moment. You would usually hire an actor to play yeah. a role that has this much weight to it, this much, you know, how how much it's showing how society can break down. What he's talking about is the fact that it used to be difficult to date back in the old days, but now with half of the population gone, it's even more difficult because you have to accept that they're not, that the partner that you used to have is not coming back before you move on and try and find someone to yeah. date. Like that's a, that's a really emotional gut punch that's coming from the director of the film rather than another actor. I thought that was quite an interesting thing for them to do. It's not him waving in the background like you see with Peter Jackson when he cameos in his movies. There's an actual good role, really. I was really happy about how it was treated. It was so off the cuff. It was just the the way that it was. And I was just really happy about the way that it was just said. Now, obviously, Disney have inherited uh, Nega Sonic Teenage Warhead and uh, obviously her girlfriend from Deadpool 2. It's mm -hmm. interesting that it wasn't one of the superheroes, I think, is maybe where I'm going. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I think for me, and we all have our own opinions on this stuff, but I think for me, the actual story was the important part. And it didn't matter that it was a gay character or not. I think the storyline that they've given to this character saying what it's like dating in this post-apocalypse world could have been a gay guy, a straight guy, a straight woman, could have been anybody saying it. It's the impact of how it was delivered works really well for me. Um, oh, yes. The Sorry, fact no, that it's I'm a gay like, character like, is fantastic, but... I love the, the impact of the storyline itself is what I what I really loved. You know, like we may have in future, we may have a character that we've already seen existing in the universe coming out on screen and, and going out with their boyfriend in the future. That could happen yeah. and that may be a, a whole storyline for an entire movie in the future. But I love that this storyline felt so human uh, and felt didn't feel like it was a representative or, yeah. a, or a standing out. It felt like it was just a human story of yeah. the experience for the world now. No, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, I, I thought it was really nicely uh, done, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, I think you know you see all different facets um, of how people move on here mm -hmm. in um, you know that 
that circle of people trying to cope with their losses at Steve Rogers. You have Natasha trying to build uh, the Avengers back up again, lead them into even also just to, to try and bring kind of some kind of shield type organization back to this. You have Tony um, settling down with Pepper Potts uh, yeah. and with their daughter, Morgan Stark, and him really trying to focus now on building a future. Uh, mm-hmm. You have Clint and um, sort of the injustice of it all going at, and seeking uh, revenge uh, and Thor effectively just um, losing. losing it because mm-hmm. the thing that he thought would make it better um, has just made it worse. It's not done any change and he's just burying it unlike um, Steve Rogers who's trying to talk about it, bring yeah. it up. So I, I liked how all this five years later um, kind of came on yeah. and I think to point three, though, uh, we have um, Ant Man as well, and he, uh, in this interim period, comes with a huge amount of uh, new knowledge for yeah. for the Avengers. And our our, our point three is Plan B, uh, traveling through time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from failure to um, those five years later, we have uh, a Plan B emerge as Ant Man uh, knocks on the door of Avengers HQ. It's Great that this is incorporated back into the movie this way. We saw Ant Man and the Wasp. They they kept saying that this will have huge repercussions when it comes to it, when it comes to Endgame. Did you guys like this uh, as an idea, bringing him back in and him being the one effectively given the information to, for the Avengers to save the universe? I I did. I I think they basically made him an integral partner, um, which yeah. he's fe- he he's even in Civil War. He felt uh, he felt very much like a a joke, not a joke character, a second string character, a, a tier. He didn't yeah. feel core or central. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I I'm really happy he came back. Um, they mm-hmm. the the scene alone where he's back running around the the missing mon- monument, looking for Cassie's name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, was yeah, fantastic. Yeah. This is the best dramatic performance I've seen from Paul Rudd. I've seen him in so many things over the years. He's one of those actors that's always in movies and always in TV shows. I think this is the best dramatic performance that I've seen from him uh, in anything. Yeah. Hey, hold on, hold on. We still got Clueless here. It's it's on par with Clueless. <laughs> um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, go go no, back and watch I, that film that... and tell me what you think of it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the nineties are always right. <laughs> I I agree with you. I I really enjoyed uh, Ant Man in, in this movie. Yeah. I really liked that. Not only did he kind of pull them together into this plan B that really set off that that punch into the final half of, of this movie, um, but I, I I think as well. Um, Scott Lang's character, it just balanced the seriousness of putting this time travel theory to Stark and trying to get them on board. But mm-hmm. it, it was balanced nicely with, with the humour of Scott Lang. And I, I just thought that was really nicely done. I mean, that, that moment where he's out trying to have the um, the nacho... <laughs> the taco. <laughs> the yeah. taco, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> the Quinjet arrives. Uh-huh. And all, all the inside of it just gets blown <laughs> out. It's just... Um, I chuckled hard at that. That's one. a good. That's yeah, a good yeah. comedy moment. It was a really good comedy moment. Yeah. Um, and uh, isn't it? A, and then Hulk comes out with with two more to give to him. Yeah. Uh, I, just, I just thought it was nice, and I thought there was a real good balance here. Yeah, yeah, really, really enjoyable. Uh, but yes, that brings us to kind of the central point of the movie, as you say, John. This this second plan, the traveling through time, which you know, all the way in the run up to this movie, we've heard. Go back and watch all the movies. You can you can get them all in. You've got 21 days. Watch a movie a day and you'll get to this movie. I didn't realize that they were setting us up, that the Russos were setting us up to say, you need to watch all the way back to the first Iron Man movie to get all the references that we're putting in here because we're actually traveling right through the timeline of all of these movies and maybe you might miss something. The amount of cameos and the amount of flashbacks that are in here to other characters and other people that were in previous movies were was just fantastic everybody gets an opportunity yeah, it was awesome i guessed it two days beforehand um when i saw the uh, red carpet event at, for the avengers and noticed one natalie portman appearing on the red carpet and went hang on a second natalie portman famously distanced herself from this franchise years ago have they actually got her back in this movie 
Yeah, that, I, I love this kind of trip down memory lane, if you will, this time travel look at all these different areas, you know, and uh, I mean, you just knew, say, that with Natasha and, and Hawkeye going to Vermeer, uh-huh. that that was going to just end in tears. Absolutely. Um, you really did. But I love the, them going back to New York um, with the Shatari um, attacking New York there with Loki. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I liked how they kind of paired these different things off. So I, I really enjoyed how Hulk went to the Sanctum Santorum. Obviously, you've not got Doctor Strange there. It was gr- I was amazed that we saw the Ancient One back there. Oh, that was fantastic. But I like that connection yeah. with Hulk. I love the fact that Bruce Banner was knocked out of the Hulk on the astral plane Mm -hmm. uh, and then kind of has that gardening hat um, as he's sort of knocked out and and she's speaking with Bruce Banner. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was really nicely done. I liked how... That's also the reference to the Defenders. This is is the original set of the Defenders. We have Hulk appearing at Doctor Strange's pad looking for Doctor Strange. I love the response from the Ancient One saying... Well, he's not going to be around here for at least five more years because she knows the future. She's already seen what's going to happen in the future. Really interesting discussion there. You know, as Doctor Strange fans, we've been talking about the comic books for so long now. I've seen the movie now about 40 times, John, I think, and you've seen it about 50. Uh, Something like that. So to see, to to have this character back on screen again is so good. And they do this over and over again for anybody who's a fan of any specific movie over the course of all these films. Seeing some of their favorite characters appear back on screen is really exciting. I love the conversation that happens between the two of them where the way that Bruce Banner convinces the Ancient One to give up the Time Stone is she, he says, well, Stephen gives that up. And she goes, well, he's the best of us, isn't he? So therefore, if he gives it up, I must give it to you as well. So I must have the right to give it to you I, as well. Yeah, I loved how she explained the timeline as well and how sort of as it breaks off, it goes black because mm-hmm. you have no idea what... Um, what that timeline will be and that you will have to come back. I mean, she effectively informs them you've got to then come back to bring all the stones back together again, Mm -hmm. which does then link a little bit into Loki because he is able to escape and effectively he's back alive. So again, it's okay. I haven't fully really kind of thought this through, but you know, then are they all back or is there now a double, um, tesseract stone or space stone um you have loki that has he effectively broken that timeline now because yes. so it, it it's a really uh, nice little moment here that the 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 lord of mischief is causing mischief in, in the timeline um and i'd see how that plays out in phase four to some extent it's fascinating yes the other two time stones that are uh, the other two gems that are there as well yes the tesseract and and uh, the scepter so cap going after the scepter definitely my favorite of all of them because cap is my favorite character at my favorite movies and they reincorporated back seeing all of hydra being there all the actors who are dead yeah. now uh, all coming back to play their parts as hydra and having cap in on that knowledge that these are the people that he used to trust and now they're all and now he knows they're all hydra so he gets that great comic book moment where he pretends to be a member of hydra just like hydra calf back in the comic books lovely touch that was awesome really really good yeah the the cinema went mental uh proper sort of erupted mm. at that it was really really cool and just to explain for non-comic book fans the reason why is because the storyline of hydra cap where he finds out that he has been in the pocket of Hydra, or we find out that Cap has been in the pocket of Hydra since he was first given the super soldier serum and they have trained him as Hydra. He's always known he's been Hydra and hiding it is hugely controversial being that he stands for truth, justice, the American way, the the guy that's against Hitler being Hydra is, was hugely controversial. So to have it incorporated in the movie this way, where he's pretending so that he can win the day effectively is great. Seeing him up against old Cap as well, where he the, the moral high ground cap effectively where he goes i can do this all day and you see our steve rogers looking at him going yeah i know you always say that <laughs> you know i am cap i know what you're talking about i thought it was wonderful and of course seeing robert redford back as alexander pierce in this movie is great it's really good i'd never expected to see all these actors back. Yeah. and seeing america's ass as well <laughs> bubble sort of two duck eggs in a handkerchief <laughs> I love that Steve loves his own ass as well. It's quite a, a great moment. <laughs> the the ass joke was just brilliant. It's fun. Yeah. So the one thing I will say about this film is they listen to fans and pop culture and the overall zeitgeist for the last twenty two years and try to put a payoff for everything. 
It's not 22 years, Chris. Don't worry. It's only 10. <laughs> sorry, okay. You know what I mean. In the next, when by the end of phase eight, no, uh, sorry, for 22 <laughs> films, 10 years. Yeah. It, it, it was amazing. So the joke about Captain America's ass being the ass of America. Yeah. America's ass. <laughs> it was just the fact that they played to that later. And the jo- that joke has been on Twitter for yeah. I don't know how long. Well, it's Tony that calls it out first, isn't it? He says, I must tell Cap, I much like his uh, his newer outfits rather than that old old outfit. It doesn't show off his ass well enough, you know? Uh, we have that. We have Paul Rudd's Ant-Man uh, commenting on it as well later on. And obviously Steve Rogers doing it as well. Really good moments. What did you think of, of Tony reincorporating himself back into the scene with Loki to get at the Tesseract? As our resident Iron Man fan, Chris, you get to comment on that one. All of it was just so much beautiful fan service. It's not mm-hmm, even fan yeah. service. So, like, it was callbacks even. So when yeah. he jumps out of the window um, uh, onto Stark Tower, yeah, it's the same way that he gets out uh, back in Avengers, remember? When he puts on the the, the bracelets. Mm-hmm. He was thrown out by Loki uh, yeah. out of the window. And, yeah, it's like, it's all these little things. Um, yeah. I found it hard. This is the testament to how far we've come, is I don't know which... Which scenes were like unused footage, mm-hmm. yeah. and which scenes were them de aged, and yeah. which scenes were just them kind of with body doubles? Mm-hmm. Um, because I'll, though some of those scenes do not appear ever, yeah, yeah. like yeah, exactly. so I'm like, where is this? coming from well we know how good they can do aging work with uh, with agent carter and we know how good they can do de-aging work with all of the movies that we've seen with nick fury being de-aged back in captain marvel this year so yeah hank pym as well and hank pym as well we see hank and we see a young hank pym in this film as well when yeah. they do that time jump back to the 70s which is magnificent i have to say that version of michael douglas like we were we were saying back in ant-man and the wasp that the de-aging work that they'd done to bring him back to the 80s was fantastic, but the de-aging work that they'd done to bring him back to the 70s was fantastic. It was absolutely magnificent. You know, he doesn't really have much frame of reference to be able to do that. That's great. We also yeah. see in that time jump back to the 70s because of all the mess up and the loss of the Tesseract back to Loki. They have to make that time jump back to the 70s. And we see um, Howard Stark finally getting his moment with Tony or Tony finally getting his moment with, with Howard Stark to find out really what his father actually thought about him. This is the thing that's been eating Tony up since the first ever film that he never had that proper relationship with his father and he finally gets it in this movie. That is the moment really that we knew he was gone, right? I think so. I mean, I, I love this call back to the 70s. I think um, having Tony with his dad and having that discussion about becoming a new father, I thought was really, really nice. Yeah. Um, I think having uh, Captain America effectively in, in trying to get the Tesseract back, you know, stumble into uh, Peggy's office and then see her having a, you know, a conversation with one of her um, employees kind of thing uh, in, you know, the Proto Shield organization. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really, really nice. And I'm glad that he got to to go back uh, to see her again. Yeah. Um, so he could have that, you know, more intimate uh, contact with her rather than be separated by the, the glass panel. But mm-hmm. I think, um, yeah, I just thought it was played really well because, you know, we, we covered Peggy Carter, the, the TV show, and she was such a good, or Agent Carter, um, and she's she was such a good part of um, Captain America, the first Avenger, so mm-hmm. really nice to see her. And obviously with, with Tony's dad, how that's impacted him, and certainly from the Winter Soldier um, and Civil War, knowing what... Um, the Winter Soldier did to the Stark family and how that caused that rift really between um, Iron Man and and Captain America. It it was nice to kind of have that sort of mellowed out a bit so that, you know, when Tony and Steve do effectively kiss and make up here uh, in this movie, Mm -hmm. have that reconciliation um, and there's some closure to it It from this time travel. I thought that was kind of neat, really. Definitely. So I didn't think Tony was going to die. Right. I thought this was as soon as I saw this this 1970s scene, I I knew it was goodbye for Cap. Right. Yep. yep. Just looking at uh, yeah. at Haley Atwell, I don't, mm-hmm. like, it was beautiful. Yeah. I, I went. He's gonna join her somehow. Right. Yeah. I didn't know how. I kind of guessed because they were already traveling through time. Mm-hmm. Um. I was like, okay, well. We'll see how this ends. I felt so cheated when he walked out of that room without actually talking to 
Hayley Atwell without talking to Peggy Carter after all of those decades apart and her having to live her whole life without without Steve Rogers. You see even the photograph of Steve Rogers before he got the serum is still sitting on her desk. She's never lost that love for the character. It's an interesting one because McFeely and Marcus wrote the original appearance of and the original conversations about Peggy Carter where she was saying that... Um, that Steve Rogers is the one that introduced her to her husband. He was also a Helen Commando. So does this overwrite the fact that she had another husband or was she being coy about the fact that Steve went back in time and married her? So it's a nice line. She never said the name of her husband. So it's interesting that she could have actually just been covering up the fact that it was Steve Rogers from the future coming back and being her husband. They're, they're play- this is wrinkle number two. Is it a wrinkle though? That's what I'm saying. So no, that's the thing. <laughs> so they need to explain it because it's... It- so Cap's been in the past since the 50s and basically has hidden himself. So he was there for New York in Avengers as, 1. As an old man. As an old man. This is actually the storyline from um, from The Ultimates, which takes a lot of the ideas for the Marvel Cinematic Universe that Captain Rogers didn't get put in ice and stayed alive and was just an old man when the world filled up with heroes again. Um, so I like the, that they've kind of touched on this as well. You know, it's a nice little touch that they're still pulling elements from uh, from the Ultimates. Oh, I, 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 I completely agree. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think this was a beautiful end. Um, as soon as, like, just seeing Jarvis again yeah, uh, yep. was a nice little nod. Absolutely. Um, we strange, want Agent Carter se- season three. Strange that we got, <laughs> we got, we didn't get Coulson. Yes. yes. I found I think, that strange. I didn't uh, yeah. find, I, I, as soon as we got Jarvis, I went, Okay, so they're going to include the officially um, official kind of in canon Marvel Cinematic um, TV shows. Yeah. So, and with Col- Coulson being in Captain Marvel, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, cool. Well, it means we'll get at least a, a, a Coulson cameo? Kind of. So there is a little bit of a problem that I can't talk about uh, because it will spoil Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which I know not everybody's caught up on. So um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. returns on May 10th. It's purposely out two weeks after this movie is in the cinema so i am guaranteeing there'll be some reason why any of the agents of shield didn't appear remember we've got daisy johnson in the world and she's been around for five seasons of that show and has never appeared in a movie before so if anybody was going to appear i feel it should have been her but i think they're holding that back and the explanation back as to why agents of shield hasn't mentioned this or has or they haven't appeared in the movies think they're holding that explanation back for when the show returns on may 10th you need to explain Um, this to me off air I will. I will certainly. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry, well, there fellow, is, Avengers. <laughs> fellow Avengers. <laughs> there is one trip, one other trip that we haven't talked about at all, which is Thor going back, meeting Frigga and meeting uh, his ex girlfriend back in the back in the land of uh, of Asgard. Yeah, with his rabbit. Yes, this with was rabbit. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Really? This 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 scene was literally them trying to get comic relief. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, but and then also at the same time trying to kind of um, build up Thor's confidence again, like it was just that it was cringe worthy for me. Think, I, yeah. I I got what they were trying to do. I mm-hmm. I enjoyed where they again. I didn't like where this was going. Like right. it was. It seemed like it was put in because the other two time jumps were exactly that they were they were deep they were meaningful they they had to be so they could have made this deep and meaningful with Jane Foster's and Frigga's uh, reintroduction they could have made it something really special mm-hmm. but with the with the just the tone of Thor kind of being that dude, dude from the Big Lebowski yeah uh, and kind of <laughs> that was running nice away <laughs> it wasn't I said I, I I once again you know I don't want to harp on about the fact that I don't like what they've done with Thor Chris Hemsworth loves what they've done with Thor he absolutely adores it Taika Waititi absolutely loves what they've done with Thor we know there were on set fights between him and the Russos saying I don't want you changing my character back to serious character I can't accept that I walk off the set effectively and they agreed with him and they've kept it they have done their best especially with this one which is him time jumping back to Dark World remember he's time jumping back to probably everybody's least favorite of the marvel yeah. movies nobody really likes that movie and he has to time jump back there because that's the only point in time where the stone is sitting in a, a, an available place to get so we now have as you say surfer dude or big lebowski so we're trying to interact with much more serious characters so they have to suddenly make Rennie russo be a comedic character 
all of a sudden, which she wasn't in the movies. Um, she was never that, but she has to take the piss out of her son for getting fat, effectively. Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult kind of marrying of those two worlds. But, you know, again, it's, it's there for the Thor fans. I did like the callback that as they're chasing down uh, Rocket Raccoon, you hear the guards in Asgard calling for <laughs> yeah. get the rabbit, which is a lovely nice. call to, the, to yeah. why he always thinks he's a rabbit, which is interesting. So all Asgardians see maybe that's a rabbit on Asgard. Is It looks like a raccoon on everywhere else. <laughs> or just what, what we call a rabbit, they call a raccoon. Oh, sorry, other exactly. way around. Yes. Other end. <laughs> um, look, so again, the, it it was still even nice mm-hmm. where like he got Minyor. Meow Meow. Yeah, Mjolnir, I, th- I yes. thought so. I thought it was nice to see Meow Meow back, um, for sure. Why can um, nobody pronounce Mjolnir? We've seen Mjolnir. 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 Nine films. I can't. I just actually... <laughs> I I, it's one of these things, you know, like when you enjoy <laughs> yeah. messing something up? Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like, I want to have that kind of outtakes where we go, Meow Meow, Mjolnir, Meow Meow, Meow Meow. Let's just go with Meow Meow. I have to do those outtakes. Also, it gets me one step closer to Cat Dennings, so I'm not going to complain about that. I can't say that's my reason for doing it, <laughs> but nonetheless, I just think it's a really cool way to get Molnir uh, into Meow Meow. Yeah. And then we have Rocket there, so it's a Meow Meow and a Rabbit there you go. Uh, racing around um, Asgard. Yeah. It was quite nice to be back on Asgard, actually, because, uh, and you just realize how far it's fallen going from that sort of amazing city to like a fishing village, yeah. um, ultimately. So. Uh, it, it, it's really good but I, I agree it's it's one of those difficult things with Thor now that you've got these two conflicting kind of views on what Thor is at least within the MCU mm-hmm. um, you, you have a situation where it feels a little strange because it, it, it's, it's trying to accommodate all things I think well I feel like we're now that we're in a situation where we're not building up to anything anymore we've had the battles we've had the end of this war effectively the Infinity Stone saga is, is done I think we can now see a bit more spin-off movies which is what the next Thor movie will feel like as a spin-off movie it'll feel like a separate movie not connected at all to this universe uh, and that's fine that's, that's cool gonna, like, we know where he's going to end up apparently yeah well, maybe. The first was you talked about New Asgard yeah. um, and being in the site in Tonsberg in Norway. Um, essentially, this is the, the, the same village of Tonsberg where Odin led his war against Frost Giants mm-hmm. in the very first Thor movie. Right. Um, but it's also where Johann Schmidt uh, discovered the Tesseract. Yes. Okay. We see the same church right. from Captain America, the first Avenger. Ah, uh, really? Yeah. It looked really different. I know. Will, I didn't know it was by the... 60 years later, so they have obviously rebuilt a little bit of the city after the bombing. And the, yeah, but uh, this looked like a little village. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was because it, we got c- c- told it was Tonsberg in both, and it, Tonsberg, yeah. Norway, and Tonsberg, uh, okay. Norway. Yeah. Speaking of Johann Smith, the other kind of big moment, really, as you kind of mentioned there earlier, earlier on, John, it is the big emotional punch of the movie, really. It's that we finally have... Black Widow versus Hawkeye, who can be the one to sacrifice themselves to save the universe. I think that's a really interesting touch, having these two characters. You know, Hawkeye's lost everything. And if if they succeed, he gets everything back. So sacrificing himself feels like a very difficult thing to do. But it would mean that his, his wife and kids would, would return effectively. Um, whereas obviously the choice for Black Widow here is if she sacrifices herself, she has nothing else. So if she sacrifices herself everybody else comes back and she is the ultimate hero effectively so i thought the battle between the two of them was interesting but once i kind of weighed up uh, the odds of who would die and who would live apart from the outside knowledge that we're getting a black widow movie in the future and a six-part hawkeye series on disney plus in the future you're kind of going neither of these characters can die so surprising or not surprising who 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 it was that was sacrificed not surprising right right for me not surprising um clint has his family Uh um and as soon as they didn't reconcile um, Tasha and Hulk and mm-hmm. Banner, yes. I, I went, that for me was the she's the goner. Right. Like, right. They, they, they didn't reconcile her, and they they kind of, they didn't even address that, which was even weirder. Not really. Um, yeah. Which, I, I like, they should have been some comment on that. Um, even, like, we tried it, it didn't work out joke mm-hmm. kind of thing but no as soon as they did that i i knew they 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 were gone we do know that um as you said hawkeye's getting a spin-off show 
about yeah. Kate Bishop. So knew that was coming. Um, well, yes, but I, I suppose that's probably my point. Really, is that we knew that that's coming up, and we know that the Black Widow movie is about to be produced. You know, it's going it's going into filming in in June. But I know absolutely nothing about it. I've heard nothing, none of the details behind that or behind the Hawkeye show. But in my head, I'm going. They have the opportunity with Hawkeye to do a Ronan show during that five years that are not taken away. He's still going around the world killing villains. What a great TV show that would be. What a great Hawkeye show that would be, having him around the world and training Kate Bishop as his protege, possibly. We know at the end of this movie he retires, effectively. He's now back with his family and he's retired. He's done. And that seems really likely and the right place to end that character there. But with Black Widow, it feels like she has so much more to come. So that's why it was a big surprise to me that either of them died, but you knew when going there, one of them had to to retrieve the stone. But... It was. It's, I thought it was an interesting choice to have it be Black Widow. Well, yeah. So the the, the word on the street is that the the, the Black Widow film is a prequel. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's um, that's where I, I kind of again these things start adding up. Um, <laughs> we know the street word for the last year has been wrong on everything. So I'll wait until we get some some actual press stuff. On that. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll probably talk more about it in our in our final point. But I, I, I'm slightly disparaged by the fact that some of these deaths are forever. Based on the fact that I know in comic books, death never means death. Well, yeah. yeah. So for, so then putting such a, a finale, a, a nail in the coffin on some of these, mm-hmm. especially after Gamora. Like I and I know there's probably there's financial reasons we knew Cap saying goodbye. Basically, Chris Evans as Cap. Sorry, I should say the actor said his official goodbye previously. So I think we'll, look to talk more about it later. But for me, I, I I'm slightly shocked, but I also knew it would be her. Right. Right. I think, I, I, you know, this is the movie. This is exactly what we all knew was going to happen. We were going to lose some major characters in this movie uh, at the end. At the end of it, two huge characters going out of the universe, a number of other characters that didn't come back, and Black Widow obviously dying at this point. A lot of surprise. Um, some inevitability to it. You know, there's a lot of the actors who are getting older and older and playing these roles was not going to be in their future for the rest of the of eternity. I don't want to see more and more movies about every single character that's in there either. So it's, you know, it's a nice time to say this is the event movie. We're going to give them all a big goodbye. And this really felt like an Avengers movie focused on our main Avengers, the original Avengers that have been there since the start. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think as well with traveling through time, let's not forget there was War Machine and Nebula going after the the Power Stone. And of course, that ultimately leads to Thanos becoming aware of this plan Mm -hmm. by Ant-Man, by the Avengers to come back and effectively pinch all the the gems from under his nose uh, as the two nebulas kind of uh, that their memories become entwined within some kind of timey-wimey thing um so that they sync up because they're on the same network so they actually get to see um this this synced memory Mm -hmm. uh from the uh, original uh, Nebula, who's more evil, I suppose. Uh, it's what we, it's how we saw Nebula in, to begin with. Yeah. And so, Mellow Nebula ultimately gets um, a, a bit of a kicking, really. Yeah. Uh, here from from Thanos uh, as he sends through the 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 second Nebula back to um, back to Earth once they have all all the the time gems. Mm-hmm. He effectively allows them to collect the the gems for himself. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, point four, uh, uh, we have this battle for the universe that results from this betrayal to an extent uh, by Nebula, even yeah. though it's a different Nebula. It is really interesting, that moment where we have all the Avengers sealing themselves up as Hulk puts on the glove to do the snap because he's the strongest of all the Avengers. And also as a little jab as well to, to Thor, who thinks he's the strongest of the Avengers and always has. So it is actually Hulk. Hulk is the one, the only one that can take this power effectively. Um, but I love that the attack of Thanos happens instantly after that. They snap and then the attack happens. So the Avengers don't know whether their plan has worked for a long time into this fight. They have to stand up and fight against Thanos without knowing whether everything they went through was for nothing. 
Yeah, I was a little surprised actually that it was his warship that came through the through the um, the the black hole, the the time event. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that a time space event. I thought that was really kind of neat little trick that effectively this hulking big uh, mm-hmm. warship is just looming there uh, <laughs> over the Avengers. Uh, HQ, and to be honest, uh, given the amount of missile fire coming from it, um, I thought that was pretty final uh, looking, actually, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, but they did Credits manage to survive dead. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did survive, and it does feel like this is three of our biggest Avengers against Thanos and all of his troops. We really have Thor, Steve Rogers, and Tony as being the centre of this attacking force. As you said, Chris, the moment where we have Mjolnir and Stormbreaker being uh, attracted to, to uh, Thor's power and him converting effectively back into the god of thunder at this point is a fantastic moment we have obviously another huge reaction from the audience at captain america being the one that picks up mjolnir finally showing that he's worthy a really interesting theory that one of one of our fellow uh, defenders mentioned the other day on our facebook group that the reason why cap wasn't able to lift mjolnir in the past when he had the opportunity back in avengers age of ultron was because he was holding that secret of who killed Tony's parents. And now that that secret's gone, he's now worthy of Mjolnir. I think that's really interesting. Completely agree. Uh, I, I, lo- I I heard that theory, or read that theory, I should say, and I went, ooh, mm-hmm. yeah, that because it makes sense. Yeah, it's a nice idea, isn't it? It really is, um, I think. And yeah, it's such a great moment when he, he picks up Mjolnir, um, or throws the cat, whatever you want to uh, yeah, say. Meow, meow. Meow, meow. <laughs> that's oh, gonna be that. forever we didn't see actually speaking of cats we certainly with goose uh no flurgans were uh used in, in the destruction of thanos's armies no no they were not so talk to me about this so uh-huh. up to this point they don't know if everything's happened the snap has happened how do you feel at this point in the film for me i was to say satisfied Okay. Um, I think so. We're, we're we're about two and a bit hours in to a three hour and a bit film, mm-hmm. um, and what we get is at this point what we have gotten is a time heist, yep. um, a failed plan, and some inconsistent kind of um, scenes in terms of dramatic or comedic or things like that. Okay. I, and I the check this is I'm not trying to it sounds like I say I am though. I'm not trying to kind of sway you. But I honestly I so putting my flag is I was enjoying myself. I was very yeah. satisfied. This is where things change for me. So I want to see what your what were your feelings up to this point. As of this moment, I was really shocked at how much of the previous movies had been brought into this film, and it felt like they were doing something for the fans here. It felt like, hey, you've been with us on this journey for so many years. How about we send our wonderful cast right the way back through all of the movies that you really enjoyed watching so they can do this time heist that it's called in the film itself? I thought, clicking fingers, we'll bring everybody back, and then Thanos arrives, and it feels like it's about to be final last stand for some of our favorite characters. It felt to me, I was really excited at this exact moment because it felt to me, what if Tony dies before he realizes that he has saved the world? What if Thor dies? What if Captain America dies at this moment before they've realized that what they've done has actually saved the world? Yeah, I, I, th- I think for me, um, I I was good at this point. I think... Um... I had really enjoyed the time heist. Mm-hmm. I loved every moment of that. It was thrills, spills, sad moments, you name it. Yeah. Um, and I thought the betrayal and the switcheroo with Nebula, really, really good. Um, but for sure, I think it notched up uh, a level with this battle for the universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as soon as you got all those sling ring circles starting to form on the battlefield, oh, yeah. um, that was just that was epic. It reminded me of sort of Lord of the Rings, the two towers with the the battle for Helm's Deep to an extent where you, you really got this epic scale uh, battle. Like I, I was so pleased the Dark Order uh, returned here. I love the fact that we got Ebony Moore back. It was great to see um, this, this uh, grouping back uh, yep. next to Thanos here. Um, and then, yeah, just having 
all those sling ring circles sort of begin to form to the greatest rallying cry. Yeah, of all exactly. Time on your left, really, really epic. Um, mm. Great stuff. Yeah. The, the on your left for me, for me was ah, oh, I, I was very happy with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, I think this. I have to say, I'll say it. If you guys don't want to, that's the moment when tears started forming in my eyes. No, no. For me, this wasn't. Uh, the point in a couple of seconds is where literally mm-hmm. literally less than 30 seconds later when we see <laughs> Peter Parker and um, Iron Man meet each other again. Yeah. That's where it started forming for me. Mm-hmm. That was my... Uh, I hadn't up until that point. Yeah. I hadn't kind of... I, I, I kind of went, oh, that was really nice and I got the goosebumps in a couple of places. Uh-huh. But that from that scene of Tony, uh, Peter coming back and going, oh, and and then you know I I, I, I kind of went away and now I'm back and this is like what's happening, mm-hmm. like that for me was and just seeing Tony's face, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it all makes sense, you know. If, yeah. the, if the return has happened, if the snap has happened, and all of these people have appeared around the world or in different planets in some cases um, where they had disappeared five years before. Well, of course, you're going to take about 20 minutes or at least to tell them what's happened, bring them up to speed and then get everybody returned together. So yeah. uh, I thought that was quite interesting. The one thing that stood out to me and I mentioned this to the guys just before recording, the one thing that did stand out to me is the amount of those wonderful shields that, uh, that Dr. Strange uses, the amount of magic users that are on the field in this battle was really surprising to me. And I wonder if that was a little bit of a setup to the future Doctor Strange 2 where Mordo's going around the world getting rid of sorcerers because there's too much magic in the world. As he said in that post credit sting back in Doctor Strange 2, I wonder if just setting up the fact that there are this huge amount of sorcerers that we haven't really seen much of. We've only ever really seen Doctor Strange and Wong uh, over the course of the last couple of years. So Yeah, it was kind of interesting that, wasn't it? Because they seem to be coming from all over the place as yeah. well because you kind of had the sling ring... Uh, where then the Valkyries came out of. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then there's also maybe different uh, magic users if you have... I, I mean, I think they're all coming from Kamataj and, and all around that. But if you think you have Brother Voodoo mm-hmm. and you have the Hood and you have you know, a whole range of different uh, types of magic uh, users, mm-hmm. um, I thought that was really good. Yeah, I mean, I thought, again, when all the... As you say, the shields come up as... Uh, Thanos effectively kind of gives an a suicide order for his ship to fire on the field yeah. in order that, that he can get back the gauntlet. So he's still there trying. And I, I think this is the thing about this. You have all these reunions happening on the, the field of battle and it's like absolutely amazing. And yet at the same time, Thanos is still there with his goal in sight, which is he's going to snap the the gauntlet again and yeah. remove half of them again will it be the same half who knows um, i thought it was really really cool how just kind of single-minded uh he was and how you got that change where you know he was in infinity war it, he was massively um sort of noble in in what he did he he was kind of that sort of uh ye oldie general that kind of really um, behaves as a, a a gentleman to his foe, um, you know. After they've been defeated, yeah. and he switches. He's like, I'm going to enjoy effectively tearing this planet apart, where because of all these pesky um, humans and yeah. the Avengers like ruining his plans. So I thought that was uh, kind of interesting switch on Thanos, who yeah. suddenly became ignoble, really a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but when he turns the, the, the weapons on even his own men, mm-hmm. yeah. like that signals for me one of the, the best intros. <laughs> Reintroductions, I should say. Mm-hmm. Like when you just see Captain Marvel blast through the atmosphere, yep. through the ship. Because yeah. for a lot of people, that's their first introduction to this woman. For the cast. On the cast, yeah. For the actual, yeah. the, the members of the MCU. Yeah. Like, because who have been gone for five years. Mm-hmm. Anyone who's gone and literally now just seeing this woman in blue, gold, and red blast yeah. through and come to their aid. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's going to make some cool, that's going to make for some cool kind of, kind of films next phase. Yeah. Like, the There's potential. A, absolutely. There's some wonderful moments in here. And I go, again, you know, that the, the warnings coming up ahead of this movie that Captain Marvel's too powerful, you can't have her on the battlefield with everybody else. Once again, they've done a great job of 
yes, she is hugely powerful, but yes, she also needs to work with other people to accomplish a specific goal, which is to get the gauntlet to uh, the van that uh, that Ant Man is is trying to fire up. You know, we have all of these wonderfully written moments where everybody has a part to play in getting to the goal of the Avengers. I love this is the first time on screen that we've ever heard Captain America call out the famous Avengers Assemble line, and it's effectively a million people on the battlefield who are now all classed as Avengers. That's cool. Great moments. Yeah, it was it was really good. I really liked as well, um, you know, Thanos using the Power Stone to knock uh, Carol Danvers and, and Captain Marvel off him because mm-hmm. she is so powerful that he's got to use, um, you know, he kind of, he is able to flick it to the other hand and then he uses it in the punch to knock her off. Um, yeah. I thought that was a real neat uh, bit of action. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just so much of this. Uh-huh. Yeah. Just, that's all I can say. <laughs> you didn't even use an adjective there, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Like, we got A-Force, which is the all-female Avengers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, like, that scene was just beautiful. It's like, we got, we got you. And it was just them just riding through and helping Carol. Yeah. All leading. And sorry, then we've got spider man scene, which was just like him flipping and fly, getting, turning uh, his suit to kill, one, one hit kill mode. Yep. <laughs> his meeting with Valkyrie. Once again, we talked about it before the first uh, Infinity War, where the meeting of this teenage kid and the magic user that is Doctor Strange was exciting. But seeing this kid meeting a woman that's riding a horse. Yeah. Through, Pegasus, uh, through the a air, Pegasus. A Pegasus oh. through the air. Thank that you. That was cool. Uh, that's a cool moment. It's really yeah. interesting seeing this this kid from Queens and all of these experiences that he's had where he's been in outer space. He's now meeting uh, creatures, mythical creatures, effectively. It's cool. It's a great, a great viewpoint to have. He didn't stop talking from the moment he got on screen. This is Peter Parker making up for the fact that he has missed a bit about a movie and a half. So yeah. he just... Talks and talks and talks the whole way through. <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. And here and hearing uh, Cap say Queens, mm-hmm. Queens go long. Exactly, exactly. That was just perfect for me. Yeah, really good. It really we was. did have the reintroduction of another fan favorite character at the table, John uh, Doctor Strange. What's your feeling about his moment of stoicism as he returns to find that his plan is now in motion? He was very stoic, actually. Um, I-, I found him a little severe in this movie, actually, and I suppose maybe the gravity of what he sees in Infinity War. I suppose you can really kind of um, get that. Yeah, I-, I, th- I kind of just felt that Doctor Strange was really severe, even at um, you know spoilers at Tony's funeral yeah. uh, at the end. He's kind of just stood there, really, really severe. And I thought there would be a bit more interaction with him and Tony around that vision. But in effect, it was distilled down to a glance on the battlefield when um, he's there and Tony manages to get the... I think that's when Tony realises that uh, the reason why he saved his life on uh, Titan was because Tony has to sacrifice his life at another moment in time, Mm -hmm. he can't be killed by uh, Thanos. And that's the only way. And that was the only way to save um, Tony's life was to exchange it for the time gem. That was the bargaining chip that was big enough for Thanos not to kill uh, Tony Stark. Yeah. Um, And so I thought, I I thought that was all kind of good, but it was all a bit like knowing nods on the battlefield. Um, I thought what was really interesting though, was, whatever the water that he was holding up from coming onto the battlefield. Mm -hmm. I wasn't entirely sure. Was that just something um, uh, because a missile was going to sort of release this lake onto the battlefield and it was going to just flood everything and drown everyone? Or was there something a bit bigger here? I know there's been... No more has been thrown out here because there's a possibility of him being introduced as well. Yeah, I I don't know. And I have to say there's there's definitely points in this movie that I really want to watch again. I'm absolutely going to see yeah, this movie well, again. Um, but there's so much going on in this battle moment. I Maybe I missed a line as to what it was that Doctor Strange was preventing from attacking. I was connecting it to that moment early on in the movie with Akoya ask, being asked about the crack in the ocean and what she was going to do to stop it. And then we have this huge bar of water coming coming down on top of where the Avengers are. Um, 
it does it would be really interesting if that was no is that a possible introduction to Namor. But you're probably right. It is more likely that it was just he was trying to prevent the whole battlefield from being flooded and killing everybody. Yeah, I, I'm with you on I think you'll believe it was the second one. Yeah. Um, but the Namor theory is, is there and it's it's a separate kind of piece. But this leads us to the one finger that basically changes everything. So we see Tony ask um Doctor Strange, was this it? Was this was this the one? Is it is this the the, the one way that it, it's going to end mm-hmm. and then we see as they're starting to lose and Thanos gets very close to getting his full infinity content back on and going to click his fingers you see Strange just put the one finger in the air like mm-hmm, this yeah. is the one timeline you, we need to win this yeah. so we see Tony pull some amazing switcheroo there yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Proper. It was worthy of a great poker player. Yeah, like I, I just, and for me that was just amazing. Um, yeah, it was just Tony sacrificing himself, mm-hmm. uh, and it's been said by like even Hulk. Hulk kind of it fully explains that like no one else can survive survive this. The gamma radiation alone, yes, um, exactly, will kill you. Exactly. Um, it was just that. That for me was. It, just an amazing end and with the click of the fingers everything turns to dust they all turn to dust yes all of Thanos' men turn to dust I love how slow the reveal is that that's what's happened everything stops on the battlefield as they start to turn to dust yeah with Thanos being the last one to go of course um, just a, a nice a nice moment you almost feel like in Tony's head he's giving very specific instructions for what's about to happen here and he's going and I want Thanos to see them all disappear before he goes <laughs> you know that's what it feels like yeah, no. For me, this was it was just so well done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think you know to your, to your point about Doctor Strange and how stoic he is here, it does feel like he needs to be. It feels like he's what he's got in his head is I've seen fourteen million possibilities. In one of those possibilities, I told Tony Stark that he had to sacrifice himself, and he didn't. Or I told Tony Stark that he had to sacrifice himself, and he did it too early, or something like that. So he's not willing to tread on the this version that's actually working. Do you yeah, know what I mean, it feels like he's going. I can't say a word here, just in case yeah, I do yeah. the wrong thing. No, that's you know? true. Yeah, yeah. This is this is where I started getting like, oh, this was not how I wanted it to. So again, I'm going to start saying this. This is not how I wanted it to go. Okay. But more because it's the end. It's the end uh-huh. game. Yeah, yeah. And it was, but I'm like, I fully respect how this ends. Yeah, like absolutely this is well, let's get into the end there our exactly. point number five is the end and what an end it is because it is the end of an era it is 22 years we were saying going into 10 to watch this movie we had kids who were 12 years old going to see Endgame. they were only two years old when the first movie came out this is their entire cinematic experience you know this is the cinematic experience with so many people who've watched these movies and giving everybody an end is a really really difficult thing to do obviously chris i totally understand losing tony stark is a huge thing that's your favorite Marvel character before Spider Man, yeah. of course. At least you have Spider Man there, though, right? <laughs> it's true, but I also don't think we've lost Tony Stark. I'm putting what makes you there. think that? What makes you think that? The hologram at Tony's funeral. The the hologram. Um, so this is me pulling from the comic books. So and also pulling from knowledge of what's currently going on in contracts and stuff. Okay. Uh, Chris Evans has officially said his goodbye uh, on mm. social media. Robert Downey Jr. has not. Robert Downey Jr. would never say a goodbye. To exactly. This <laughs> never In the would. comic books, <laughs> when Tony Stark went into a deep coma, but everyone thought he was dead, mm-hmm. he uploaded his a, his consciousness into an AI, like yeah. Friday and Jarvis, and it was Tony. Mm-hmm. We just saw at the very end of this when his last will, Tony's last will and testament, is being given. Like that's how I think Tony Stark will live on in the MCU. Right. I right. think he will be a blue hologram, but it will be an AI like Jarvis, or right. uh, and that's how we'll see. Like potentially, Robert Downey Jr. might be in Far From Home. Right. Uh, that's how yeah. Robert Downey Jr. can be in Iron Man four, five, six, seven. Like it's he spent five years recording messages for uh, for Peter Parker. I think he's done. But there's loads of other characters. I know Tony's the big character. It's a huge loss. Loads of other characters that that have gone, and loads of other characters whose stories are ending, and other characters that are One- kicking off. You know? the, the only additional bit that's being fueled by this is he's looking directly at his daughter 
and Pepper when he says his last line. But if it was recording and he the people weren't there, it, so it's the AI actually saying this and saying it to them. So just that this people have already started pointing this out that he's actually talking yeah. to Pepper <laughs> and Morgan. I'm not sure. I think one of the things that I find interesting about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that they've always said when there is a death, it has to matter. It has to be a, a finality to it if there is an actual death. The death of Groot, for example, in Guardians of the Galaxy actually mattered, even though we saw a baby Groot in the next movie. These things do have to matter. Tony Stark is a fantastic character and has been there since the first movie. It's 10 years now that Robert Downey Jr. has been pushing, putting away other projects to do these films in the Marvel Universe. They've driven the dump truck full of money up to his house quite a few times to get him back for uh, for renegotiations of his contract. I think Marvel may be kind of going, this guy is, is fantastic, but this is a good natural end for the character. Hey, we might see a cameo in the future, possibly, yeah. but it may be in a flashback, as, as more, I would think, because it's going to take a lot for me to believe this character is not alive or is has created an AI and will live on and even have an Iron Man 4 movie in the future. I think that's almost an impossibility without creating a new person wearing that outfit. Well, you got Morgan. For me. Yes, yes, possibly. That's the thing. Uh, sorry, continuing on. I think, Derek, I want, I want you to take this one. This was one of my most favorite endings of how exits... <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, obviously, you can't see our, our notes, fellow defenders, but uh, our next one really is Captain America, really, how how we finish off the story of Steve Rogers. It's a perfect end for any Captain America fans out there, I think. Um, we have him say goodbye to his best friends. We have him say goodbye to Bucky and say goodbye to Falcon as he sets them up together, effectively, to be the new buddy cops in the future. <laughs> he goes off into the past to give back the, the stones, and we're told he's going to be back in 15 seconds, but he doesn't arrive back. We see an old man sitting, uh, calling for his best friends to come over and surround him. Uh, as he hands over the uh, the shield to Falcon to create Sam Wilson as the new Captain America. Very cool. <laughs> really, really enjoyed that. And then we find out he's lived his life with Peggy Carter. The one thing that he hasn't been able to do and has been wishing to do. He got to have that dance. We get the flashback to the 70s yeah. where he went back to Peggy Carter and he has that dance in her house. The dance that he promised to her 10 years ago, guys. That's a huge, huge moment. Uh, floods of tears for me on this one. Yeah, it was it was a great moment, I think, um, having Cap go back. Uh, he really did look like a Republican voter, though, uh, I have to say, um, when he <laughs> the, with all his, his old skin. Um, but I certainly did. Uh, Cap is not a Republican voter. He's a non-political I did, character. Though. I did like uh, that he, he went back. I, I think... Um, yeah, it's a really good end because I do think, you know, Captain America and Iron Man, these are the two strong threads that run, you know, these these movies mm -hmm. um, that that have happened leading all up to here. It's the glue that meshes them all coming in together um, here for the, this final movie. And so I thought it was really good. And I, I, I like that they have, um, I think for me, him handing it off to... Uh, the Falcon it was just really fantastic, and yeah. and the fact that um you have him and Winter Soldier effectively going to work together certainly because you know Falcon probably didn't quite like Bucky that mm -hmm. much, so I, I I like that kind of dynamic between the two. So that that was awesome, uh, and I really liked what happens. The fact you know Loki is somewhere with an Infinity Stone. Um, causing mischief and that Valkyrie now is the, the new Lord of Asgard as well I thought was really uh, cool. Is Loki alive? I think so. So they went back to the original Avengers right and they mm -hmm. screwed things up and then they went back to the 70s and took it from the yeah. 70s therefore everything at the all the, the changes that happened during the original Avengers film didn't happen. So timey wimey stuff. Yeah, exactly. A big, big challenge here for the Loki specifically, and we know we're going to get a Loki TV series uh, in the future, uh, starring Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Um, he is alive, but it does kind of mean he won the Battle of New York and didn't lose it because he effectively his mission to go to Earth was to get the Tesseract and bring it back to his master at the time, which was Thanos. Um, he effectively gets the Tesseract into his hands and then jumps out of there holding the Tesseract effectively. So he's actually won. He's, he has left Earth with the, with the stone to give to his master Thanos. So Thanos has just gotten it early. 
We don't really know because we don't know whether that means that Thanos wouldn't have chased down the Asgardians and killed them all because he already has the Tesseract. Effectively, that's where the timey-wimey weirdness is going to come in and will only be explained in the future, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah. That's why we're getting a, a Loki show, yeah. really, right? I mean, it, it has to be. And I think it ultimately plays into the fact that um, you have the Ancient One talk about this diverging timeline and that the mm-hmm. only way to bring it back is to have all the stones collected together. But they've had to go further back to collect the space stone to bring it. So and put it back but ultimately there is a reality so this diverging timeline where they didn't have the space so that they have created multiple time threads yeah. now which the ancient one kind of talks about uh to some extent with the hulk uh with bruce banner yeah so yeah it'll be interesting to see how um or if that plays out in any way it must do Potentially, or it's just, you know, the underline will be put on and something else will happen. Well, as I say, the Disney Plus stuff that's coming up, these are the kind of threads I feel like they're going to explore. Like, there is some interesting pieces here. We know that we're going to have a TV show with Falcon and Winter Soldier. So that's been set up right here. This piece where Loki escapes, that means Loki's alive. So we thought it could have been something that was happening in the adventures of Loki before he died in Infinity War. This could actually take place after Uh, the first Avengers movie and see the new timeline of Loki and how it gets repaired effectively. Uh, Interestingly, we also have that that discussion with Clint Barton talking to Wanda about the true loss here because Barton lost Natasha, who isn't coming back. Black Widow's not coming back. According to this movie, there's no way to bring her back. Hulk tried. Um, And Wanda has lost Vision. Vision is gone. He died giving up the stone effectively to Thanos in the first movie and he's not coming back yet we have a tv show featuring wanda and vision coming out later on this year or later on in 2020 so um these are all interesting things that are that make you question what you're actually seeing on screen and, and make you wonder if there's this stuff is going to be filled out in future yeah because our gamora is, has been replaced by another timeline gamora mm-hmm. as well or a sorry a gamora from an earlier time brought yeah. forward exactly. so is she the same Gamora? Because obviously, um, she's she's dropped back into you know ahead of time, and I, I do like that moment where she goes, "I was attracted to him as yeah. Star Lord is there." So, like that must mess with the dynamic. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, she's not on the Asgardians of the Galaxy ship. That's no, right. exactly. Leaving. So, like, yeah. I, for me, I'm like, I'm actually quite happy how that ended. I think James Gunn and uh, will do well with the Asgardians of the Galaxy. So we have Thor jumping on the ship with the Guardians, and I think that will be like literally. I can already see the logo. It's going to be Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three and a big AS in front of it, spray painted. <laughs> like that's literally how they're going to do it. Like it's maybe, um, yeah. and you're going to have Chris Hemsworth there. I don't think we're going to get a. F- Thor four, uh, it hasn't been confirmed yet. Um, or it, yeah, they, they could. We they certainly couldn't confirm anything before this movie no. was coming out. I definitely feel we're going to start getting more and more movie announcements. I've seen tons of speculative posts for the last year on movies that are possibly in production and possibly coming up, but there are actually very small numbers of details of actual movies that are coming up. So I'm sure we're going to start getting those announcements as people have seen this movie and, and yeah. learn who dies and learn who lives. It's interesting that they would take Thor out of the hands of Taika Waititi and put him into James Gunn's hands for Guardians of the Galaxy 3, considering how successful Thor Ragnarok was for people that enjoyed that movie. Uh, it would be very interesting that we, they wouldn't go back to Taika Waititi to do another film, uh, having taken that character for uh, away for a couple of years while they did these Avengers movies. So uh, I kind of expect that we may see... Taika dealing with the as Guardians of the Galaxy, and then they split up, and then we see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three, possibly. But we'll we'll see how that one plays out. Ah, the the timeline of this, literally not just in the in the real life, but also in the MCU, is mm-hmm. there's a lot here. I'm like, oh, but what about? I know. Speaking of, it hurts my brain to be honest at the moment because <laughs> I'm kind of like going. Yeah. I just want I, I I need to map it out. Well the good thing is this is my the OCD real way. end. This is the end of this particular adventure, this particular Infinity Stone saga, I suppose, up until this point. But it's not the end of all the movies. We still have Spider Man Far From Home coming out in just a couple of months' time where that we'll actually true. see Nick Fury a lot more in that movie. This movie 
does it kind of fit in with our Summer of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Season of S.H.I.E.L.D. as we've been calling uh, these movies this year? I guess so, because we did go back to the Avengers and we had a lot of members of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the movie. We had, went back to the origins of, of S.H.I.E.L.D. with Peggy Carter as well. So it does all kind of fit in. But Nick Fury only got one scene in this movie, equaling the number of appearances of a Marvel character with Robert Downey Jr., who has had exactly the same number of appearances. And then we get to Far From Home uh, in just a couple of months' time with a definite appearance of Nick Fury throughout that movie as well. So that's going to be really enjoyable. One lovely touch at the end of this film, I think, was having one of the last lines with John Favreau discussing yes. having a conversation yeah. with Iron Man's daughter. John Favreau obviously was the one that brought the original Iron Man movie to life. It was a kind of a passion project with Kevin Feige working with John Favreau, a then quite, you know, not well known director, but he kind of made his mark. And Robert Downey Jr., who was kind of coming back from a couple of years in the wilderness. And they came up with this whole concept of what an Iron Man movie would come for. A lot of people didn't expect it to be this big. When it was at San Diego Comic-Con, it was a very small presentation in front of a couple of thousand people. Now you'd have to queue up for about six weeks to see these people in yeah, the room. You know? Definitely. Um, it's great that they gave that final moment to them. Uh, it's just, yeah, exactly. It's the ultimate callback and nod. It's like, mm-hmm. you started this journey, we'll end this journey with you. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. The, the callback on cheeseburgers from Iron Man yes. 1 yeah. all he wants <laughs> back was well, when he got back from the war was uh, a cheeseburger And just, mm-hmm. I know when I'm going to rewatch this a couple of times I know I'm yeah. going to keep picking up all these little nods That there's only so many that every, I, I'm pretty sure that by the time this is released on Blu-ray and DVD and whatever mm-hmm. 80% of them will be found only 80% yeah. and they'll be like Okay, that's when people will start really kind of getting in for the the, the special Easter eggs. Absolutely, there's lo- loads of them. In fact, I think there's still in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume One. I think there's still one Easter egg that was put in there by James Gunn that hasn't been found. Yeah. And I feel like that's what this film's like. You know, even that moment that we didn't even mention, it is so obvious. But that moment when Cap walks into the lift full of Hydra men, that's a, a direct callback to one of the best fight sequences in the MCU so far, back in Civil War, when he is surrounded by all of the members of Hydra and they have that battle in the lift. It's exactly how we all thought it was going to play out, was another fight in the lift, but Cap walks out of there with a the Tesseract just by saying, Hail Hydra. Great moment, but it is a callback to a movie, plus a call to the comics. Loads of different layers in there, and people see yeah. what they what they are interested in seeing, I suppose, in there. Yeah. No uh, post credit scenes in this movie. Uh, interesting choice, uh, kind of a, given that, the MCU effectively created post credit scenes. I suppose the only thing you may call a post credit scene is the six original Avengers getting their huge portraits on screen uh, with their signatures on there uh, in in the credits. That's yeah. kind of the only post credit scene that you may may think of. It feels like all six of those Avengers are signing off and saying goodbye for a while. Um, that may be what it's indicating, but I thought it was really classy. It was a really cool kind of ending. And then that final moment right at the end, which got a couple of groans from an audience who'd sat waiting through a lot of credits, <laughs> unfortunately. But the kind of metal on metal um, gongs at the end of, of the credits, that could be just signifying. Uh, it sounded a little bit to me anyway, like uh, Tony building his first armor back in Iron Man 1. It sounded like that kind of hammering because we've seen that so often in these trailers saying this is the end of, a, of an era. I've seen that, that moment of Tony Stark with the hammer building his, his Iron Man suit. So maybe that's what I think it is. Any Anybody else have any ideas what it could have been? So I've seen a couple of people say that it was three bells. Uh, mm-hmm. So one for each of the, the Lost Avengers. Which is? One, one for, a bell for Natasha, a bell for Tony, and a bell for Cap. Right. So it's kind of like, right. it, it's almost like a funeral bell. Like, boing, yeah. they're gone. Like, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of the funeral, because we should, really, shouldn't we? Um, the actual moment of Tony's funeral where we have uh, many members of the cast appearing uh, and uh, I guess many people that we haven't seen in, in this movie or any of the movies for a while. Um, we even see Harley, who was the uh, the young kid that was in Iron Man 3. We see him standing uh, at Tony's house at the funeral. So yeah. lovely little touches here to tie it all back in the history of the characters. It's also important that most of the people that are there, it's not every single character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's most of the characters that interacted with Tony over the years in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So uh, nice touches there. Interesting to see who was there. I, I thought it was so funny, so many people freaking out about who that kid was on the internet. It was like, <laughs> who is he? Who is he? And it's like, a bit of IMDb and you'll see people. It's not... Well, yeah. It's a, calm down. It's okay. <laughs> 
It's a lovely touch because we haven't seen them since since Iron yeah. Man three. You know, once once that series of films for Iron Man finished, and you know, it, it wasn't spectacular in the box office. The third Iron Man film, I think it's actually my favorite of the three films, but it what didn't do spectacularly in the box office. So Tony Stark's story kind of ended there, and he's been a cameo player from that point onwards. Really, in these movies, he was quite central in the films. He's obviously a huge character, but his individual life story kind of stopped with Iron Man three. So there wasn't a possibility of bringing that character Harley back in the future to see what happened to him and see how he, how he got on and what happened after that film. So it's just a nice touch to have him in the background here, showing that they kept in contact, I suppose. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and then the, the, the closing, one of the closing shots for me, which really kind of made me, ugh, is the, the proof that Tony Stark has a heart yes. being placed yeah. on the wreath and then the wreath yeah. sent out. I was just like, lovely callback, beautifully done, just yeah like this is i was happy by the end of this when i was like it mm-hmm. was finished yeah really really good really really good uh and cameos easter eggs that kind of stuff guys so i'll let you guys take the stanley because i'm gonna take quite a few now in a few minutes <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so Stanley Cameo was a, a DH Stanley back in the seventies uh, as the driver of a car going past uh, going past the Shield headquarters, or effectively where Captain America was created, the uh, the same uh, army stand. So I believe that's the last Stanley Cameo that was filmed. Um, we won't actually see any more filmed Stanley Cameos in the future. So yeah. Um, okay, so over to me. Cracking. Let's do this. Uh, okay, so back in the. Um scene with uh, Russo and Cap in the uh, support center the Jim Starlin who is the original writer of the Infinity Gauntlet comic books uh, so mm-hmm. basically the guy who pretty much created Thanos uh, as we know him now um kind right. of turning kind of Thanos as just a smaller bit character into the cosmic titan he uh he was in that uh, scene as well right very good uh so we have Hank Pym's original Ant-Man helmet um, in the scene in the 1970s in the laboratory when we see mm-hmm. um, him there. So he's w- wearing that there. Uh, the uh, song playing when Cap and uh, Peggy are dancing is the same yep. song from the original. Absolutely. Um, which I just thought was it's just so beautiful, like lovely callback. Yeah. And the last one for me is when Ant-Man is kicked out from the quantum realm back in to uh, the the current universe. He lands in the locker 616, which is obviously a nod to the universe, the Marvel Universe 616, which is the main universe in the continuity. And that's what the naming convention for it is. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice touch. Yeah, uh, in that cool. same scene, we had our cameo of Ken Jeong from, uh, from, Ka- from Community. As I mentioned earlier on, a couple of cameos in here. We've had a number of characters in the past from from Community appear in uh, in various ones of these movies from the Russo brothers. So uh, interesting to have two in here with Ken Jong as the security guard of the of the area where Scott Lang arrives back. That's quite a cool touch. Uh, Yvette Nicole Brown as the Shield agent um, in the seventies. I thought was a great moment having her in there. She's a great comedy actress and nice nice touch to include her. There's not many of those characters left. Uh, from community that haven't appeared in the Marvel Universe yet. I'm sure there are loads and loads of other Easter eggs, so uh, I'm sure we'll see loads more of them the next time we go and see the movie as well. But overall, that is our discussion about Avengers Endgame, and we will get some feedback in, but we do have to talk about our defense first. Chris, do you want to go first? Do you defend Avengers Endgame? I do. I really do. This was a beautiful ending to, uh, as we said, 10 years, 22 films. Um, there's nothing, there's, there's certain things I would have done differently. Uh, I'm not, I'm just going to say that like, but I'm not a filmmaker. I I think that's just me being, oh, I want you to do it how I wanted it. Um, but there's how they did it was beautiful. When you start thinking about it, like this is the culmination of, as I say, 22 films with callbacks to nearly 22 films. Um, mm-hmm. all weaved in um, with how many hours so tw- 22 by so what 48 hours like two days worth of film to take t- to call upon um, the am I happy with the deaths no because who's who's <laughs> ever happy with death um, uh-huh. I want these characters to stay alive forever i want these actors to continue playing them forever but that was never going to be the case so Mm -hmm. 
this how this ended for me was really well done. Um, it leaves a lot of questions, but I think that's okay because we know that Disney Plus streaming service is coming. We also know that uh, after July, once uh, Far From Home finishes, that is the end of the Phase 4, and we get all the details for Phase 5. Um, and that's the, the interesting part. So the future is... The future is interesting. Um, mm-hmm. Lest we not forget that all of the X-Men and the Fantastic Four universe are in, rights are now with Marvel Studios. Mm-hmm. So we have a whole other ball game there, people. Uh, Secret Wars is coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting. So yeah, in the end, I do defend this film. Um, I think this is one of the most... It's going to. It's the return of the Jedi for a whole new generation. Excellent, John. Do you defend Avengers Endgame? Yes, I do defend this movie, Avengers Endgame. I give it four rabbit raccoons out of five. Okay. Um, yeah, I I really enjoyed this. Um, it's epic. It's awesome. It brings so many things together, mm-hmm. um, and it, it does it in a really nice way. We have some, you know, some meaningful losses here. Um, and it, it's heartbreaking. I love the time heist. I loved Ant Man um, bringing this together, uh, and then the the battle at the end, where you just see all these players on the on the field. Um, first of all, trying to take down Thanos. Uh, then, obviously, just the three of them with uh, Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor. And then as that snap ha- has reinstated the the half of the population. They all come charging in as well, and mm-hmm. then they're having to scramble to to stop Thanos getting the gauntlet again. It's like I just thought it was a, a, amazing. Um, I e- even at the start it was a little slow for me personally, but I think everything else was made up for that. It was a really epic. Um, epic movie so yes I do defend uh, this movie Derek what about yourself do you defend Avengers Endgame (laughs) of course I defend this movie there's no doubt I was going to defend this movie this was absolutely brilliant I had zero problems with this movie I I would absolutely give this 5 out of 5 they stuck the landing so well in this movie I have seen so so many theories about what this movie was going to do and heard so many people complain about what they thought might happen and who was going to be the savior and who was going to do this and who was going to do that these guys knew it for a year kept it silent and have delivered in the best way possible with loads of surprises loads of surprise deaths loads of deaths of people that I don't didn't want to go but They have finished off the storyline of two of my favorite characters in the Marvel Universe so well. And I'm so glad that we got this movie. It was so exciting to watch. I was so emotional. (laughs) There's nothing else that I had left in me at the end of this movie. Um, Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Can't wait to go back and see it again. Well, so gentlemen, I think that is, we are in agreement. The end game has come. The end game has passed. And we are very happy with it. Definitely a movie that we all defend. I don't think there was ever going to be a doubt. We all had a great time at this movie. Chris, I know you've got to run off. The next time we see you or the next time we hear you on this podcast, you're going to be a married man. I am, yes. Um, so someone has managed to lock it down with the Infinity Glantlet. Um <laughs> Is it Iron Man? <laughs> or Spider-Man? It's neither. It's uh, Captain Marvel. <laughs> it's Captain Marvel oh, herself. Wee. Um, Excellent. No, so yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, as we record this, I am T-minus less than two weeks. And um, mm-hmm. as any of our fellow defenders who are already married know, these, the final few days are uh, busy. Much like the time yes. heist, I wish I could go back and kind of just spend <laughs> and jiggle and change around to timey-wimey. But uh, no, so uh-huh. unfortunately, I've got to, I have a lot to do and little time to do it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your planning to uh, to talk to us about uh, Avengers Endgame. We will see you there uh, in a couple of weeks' time, Chris. Um, thanks yeah, so much. Absolutely. Yes, and uh, we'll be back definitely for Spider-Man Far From Home. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye, Chris. Bye. See you, Chris. <laughs> Bye. So we have a bit of feedback after Chris has left the uh, the building, left the Defenders TV podcast pod booth. A uh, bit, bit of feedback to talk through. Our first piece of feedback came by email from Stephen. He says, hello, fellow Defenders. You have so much to cover. So just a few points from me. The whole battle scene at the end was just tremendous. 
Uh, number two, I may have squealed slightly when Cap was able to wield Mjolnir and Thor shouts, I knew it. <laughs> I full on cried during Stark's funeral, especially when Happy was having the cheeseburger conversation with Morgan Stark. Great callback to Iron Man 1. A couple of points I need clarity on. Number one, I'm assuming Cap found a way to stop his serum working as he obviously grew old in the timeline and then he went back to be with Peggy. Stephen actually clarified that in, a, in another email saying that he realised that in the movies the serum doesn't necessarily make him age slower. That's actually a Nick Fury comic book thing that Nick Fury doesn't age with his serum that's in his blood. Um, but that's that point, I suppose, that point of clarity is sorted for Stephen. Uh, his other point of clarity for the movie, he says, I'm assuming the young lad at Stark's funeral was the boy from Iron Man 3, just growing up a bit. Yes, yeah. yes, it was Harley. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, for that. He's... Uh Certainly, uh, yeah, all grown up since Iron Man 3. Yeah, uh, Harley, so, yeah. yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, I think that whole battle at the end from start to finish was just like, whoa, they really <laughs> uh, pushed out all the stops, definitely. Yeah, it was fantastic. Actually, the actor who played Harley is in uh, the TV show Chimerica, which just started a couple of weeks ago. So I have to check him out on that. Apparently, uh, very good. So let's get on to some Facebook feedback, John. Yeah, over on Facebook, uh, Jim Carrey goes, In one of the last scenes, the camera went from group to group and lingered on various affinities. Guardians were kind of together. There was a single young man without companions. My buddy and I couldn't place him. I don't think he was Peter Parker, but probably not far from his age. Who was he? See, everybody wants to know who Harley is. It's amazing how a child actor coming back to the movies after four or five years being away, how you wouldn't notice him. Like Again, if we'd had an Iron Man 4 or an Iron Man 5 over the last yeah, couple yeah. of years, you probably would have seen him in the movies. You know? Definitely, definitely. Thanks for that, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Jim, for that. Uh, Richard Blaze, also on Facebook, goes, Great film and an ending that is full of satisfaction after 22 films and 10 years. I need to watch it again, again, and again already pre-ordered it yeah absolutely richard i think you really have to um spend another uh few times looking over this movie there is so much going on in it uh so many different references and it is really very layered in terms of its own history uh, in terms of linking with comics and a whole range of other things so really really cool mm -hmm. thanks for that richard uh, matthew debarger says it is an amazing accomplishment how many times in life are you handed something with this much build-up and pressure behind it and it delivers nearly perfectly the russos should just walk off into the sun sunset now <laughs> please don't Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Doug Green says, I kept it together until Peter saw Ned again. Then it was all over. Oh, Doug, great moment. Yeah, Peter returning to school, seeing his best friend Ned after they'd been apart for five years. Nobody knows whether Ned disappeared in the snap as well as Peter That's did. That's true, and actually. Both of them could have been returning to school at the same time. That's an interesting one, but great to see the two characters back together again. I wonder if we will learn a bit more about Ned's fate in uh, Far From Home absolutely guaranteed i'd say yeah trevor green says still confused about how the timeline works and where this leaves agents of shield and other tv shows connected to the universe going forward but very satisfied overall yeah one of the weird things that's come out during the time promoting uh, avengers over the last year is and obviously the release of disney plus one of the weird things that's come out is Kevin Feige's insistence that the new shows won't be like the old Marvel shows and will tie in absolutely directly into the MCU. So all of that discussion about the event, about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and everything being all connected, they were all connected, but Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has had to do, you know, 100 episodes, 110 episodes yeah. or more of TV shows when movies are going on and they've gone off in their own universe doing their own things. But I feel pretty confident saying that in couple of days time when agents of shield returns on the 10th of may we are going to get some answers as to why it doesn't tie in directly to these movies and why certain characters may be appearing back in the show that haven't been in the show for a while yeah so be interesting to see yeah thanks trevor for that um ronaldo uh, also says over on facebook without a doubt this paid off all the mcu movies in spades not only was it a love letter to all those who watched all the mcu movies from the start but it was a love letter to the comic fans too it seemed like everything was addressed and given closure the russos are the masters of handling an ensemble mm -hmm. and this event the 10 years of marvel studios will go down as one of the cinema's great achievements it's just so immense in scale and the build-up has been like nothing we've ever seen before in cinema as far as i know the fact that the ending was handled so well by the russos is astounding i know it's a pipe dream but the only thing lacking was seeing the netflix heroes agents of shield and the other properties 
runaways, cloak and dagger, etc. included, were totally understandable that this would have been a night impossible to pull off. Uh, refraining from saying any spoilers, though, this is a spoiler thread. I'll just <laughs> end by saying it's not often movies stay with me days after watching. This one certainly has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ronaldo, for that. Yeah, I mean, it's such a massive, massive movie. And, and agreed, it would have been so good to have had the the Netflix heroes. Like Jarvis coming in from Agent Carter, mm-hmm. it would have been great to see um, some of the other Marvel properties that are over on TV. And and certainly, as we pulled out, um, you know, the absence of Coulson may be uh, slightly uh, telling here, but again, we will find out in a, a few days' time. Absolutely. I'm not um, spoiling the season. Sure. I'm not spoiling the last season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. You guys just have to watch that one and you should <laughs> understand why Coulson doesn't appear in this movie. I wonder if maybe in one of those pan shots of that immense battlefield there are some CGI Daredevil, Iron Fist, Luke Cage and Jessica Jones along with the Punisher all battling <laughs> Thanos' evil horde. Uh, Claire Laffer also says, uh, the only way this could have been improved for me is having the, the, the Defenders plus Coulson and the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. walk out of one of those portals with the others in the end battle. Other than that, the film was pretty perfect. What an accomplishment for everyone involved and what a time for us Marvel fans to be living in. I wonder how it will affect things for Spidey Far From Home. Like all the school kids who weren't snapped will now be five years older than the ones who were. It's a really good point. Claire had some really interesting thoughts about this concept of the timey wiminess of it. It was an interesting call, obviously, for having Tony Stark saying, I want this all changed. I want everybody back, but I don't want to get those five years back. I want uh, everybody to appear now, effectively. That was his one demand so that he could yeah. keep his child and keep the life that he'd finally created after all those years of stunted growth, I suppose, from, from Tony Stark. So it's an interesting choice because it does mess with so many other movies. Um, I liked a theory that I heard the other day, which was possibly all the characters that we know from Spider-Man, uh, the first Spider-Man movie. Maybe all of them were snapped away, and the school trip they go on is to rebond them with the rest of the with the rest of the team or the or the new school students that they'll now be in, because everybody else will have graduated. The school doesn't last for more than five years, right? Uh, high school, yeah, anyway. exactly. Uh, so everybody else that was in his class will now have graduated. So uh, that's probably why we have Ned at the same age. He may have been snapped away, but it's really interesting to think about this stuff. Will on, only time will tell. But I'm kind of with you, John. I wonder if there was so much going on in the battlefield that maybe there was a moment with the Defenders where they arrived and were over in one corner of that battlefield. Yeah, maybe Ned chucked a Death Star model at, at <laughs> one of the oncoming horde. Maybe, maybe. Uh, let's go on to more feedback from Selena Kisler. Yeah, Selena goes, all right, this movie was epic. Not without its issues, but my God, on first viewing, that was an absolute pleasure to watch. Loved Thor going for the head, loved all the cameos, loved Cap's ending with Peggy and passing the shield. Love the trip through time, even though the Flash series has made me hate time travel. (laughs) I like this movie's explanation of it, but still best not to think about it too much. Major spoilers ahead. R.I.P. Tony Stark, what a way to go out. When Pepper said, we're going to be okay, I relaxed a minute thinking that meant he was going to live, but then realized she meant her and the kid. Gut punch. Was background uh, rewatching Infinity War today and discovered my biggest issue with this movie. Why can 2014 Nebula see 2023 Nebula's plans with the Avengers, but not see the reasons why she turned against Thanos and that he tortured her to get the Soul Stone? I was thinking about this, and mm. I think that is what actually happens is Nebula sees what's happening right now once. Uh, 2024 Nebula arrives in the past. She sees what's going on in front of her and sees that she's going after an Infinity Stone. And from that point onwards, Thanos takes over and Ebony Maw goes into her memories to pull out the memories of this plan. But I don't think Nebula sees the plan. I think Thanos is the one that explains the plan by going through her mind. I think we we, we certainly don't see Nebula coming across that time memory mm-hmm. Um on her own, uh, and it, and as you say, I think yeah, you see Ebony more than really uh, take over in terms of running through all those different memories and yeah. files. So maybe it's just that she doesn't see it. But it's a good point, definitely, uh, Salim. I, I suppose yeah, it may seem a little selective, but ultimately yeah. because it's almost like she hiccups or something, and yeah. out comes this projector, <laughs> uh, uh, and it, it just happens to be at the the moment that gives the game away. 
way. And, yeah. and so maybe it, it is a, a little in service to the storyline to of the time heist, really, and yeah. to disrupt that time heist. But certainly, I think we can see that Ebony Moore takes over here mm-hmm. to really control what is on uh, the files and, and what is known really so um yeah and i think again with timey-wimey stuff it's probably best not to think about it <laughs> too much yeah, because yeah, yeah. It, it becomes a little bit of a head wreck and i am with you that passing of captain america's shield uh to falcon was really really good along with peggy and cap also you know having that re- reunion finally getting that dance yeah really really good i know what you mean about time travel it can be so difficult but of course as you say you know it couldn't be that easy it couldn't be right let's spin the time travel stone and get back pick up all this stuff do what we need to do and win the day you know it had there had to be some problem with thanos definitely uh, really good i did like the reference over and over again in the movie where they kept talking about uh, this isn't like back to the future stop taking your reference with <laughs> yeah. back to the future and then did exactly that they kept walking in in and out of the past <laughs> that was really good that moment with the hulk looking at old hulk from the original avengers and going oh god he was just such a bore wasn't he it's just all hulk smash isn't it you know, really good moments and then he does that thing where he just pushes a car you know as if trying to pretend he's the old hulk really good fun in there uh, thanks so much for that Celine. Uh, tina brown says honestly i never expected it to end this well usually the build-up is so much better than the payoff countless examples from sci-fi and fantasy horror mysteries and noir and i'm still in a bit of a state of shock right now wow yeah wow indeed it, it really did have uh so much going on that paid off robbie o'neill goes okay saw it thursday and was absolutely blown away the end of an era tears when peter parker saw tony again the ladies saying we got this mm-hmm. i will re-watch it again and marathon the two final films just to get the true feeling yeah absolutely that that back-to-back of infinity war and endgame will be a great moment when that gets released for sure just perfect thanks robbie I know him. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> Wonder who, who he is. Um, yeah, Jamie Alexander goes, "What a roller coaster of a movie! I cried so much, but the ending was so fitting. I've never heard so much applause and screaming in a movie theater before. I'm going to see it again on Tuesday. Well, hopefully, it wasn't like the Scream movie where people were getting murdered. <laughs> <laughs> Not that, that many screaming in the, in the cinema. Hopefully, they, they were all right. Same thing for us as well. Yeah. A lot of whooping uh, applause and uh, just great enjoyment of this movie. Yeah. So many uh, fantastic moments that really just got the the crowd behind this movie from uh, Molnir being picked up by Captain America to so him good. saying Hail Hydra. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so good seeing the A Force as well of all the the ladies going into battle after Thanos. So so good, mm-hmm. uh, uh, definitely. Yeah, totally agree. Really, really good cinema experience. I love that. It's just not replicatable at home anymore. You know, but having a whole group of people watching a movie and being so into it, really, really enjoyable. Finally, Ted Willard says, "Great movie. I'd love to say it was perfect, but it did have a few faults." That said, the great far outweighed the problematic. What I loved was Tony and Cap getting to their ends of their arcs that they both deserved. I liked so many moments that I can't count, but including Cap and the Hammer. On your left, moments with Peggy and Howard, Peter and Tony's reunion. I could go all day, and I know. <laughs> really good little breakdown of the entire movie there, Ted. Uh, he has mixed feelings about faulty or incomplete arcs for Hulk and Thor. Um yeah, I know what you mean, I suppose, but there is a, a basic arc for Thor, and I think he does get a lot of screen time in this movie, um, given that they were focusing on some of the other Avengers. Hulk, I always feel like they say that he gets a portion of his story told throughout these films. There is some kind of rights issues, I know, with the fact that Incredible Hulk doesn't fully uh, isn't fully owned by Marvel um, because of how the last Incredible Hulk movie was produced. So they've said that they have to spread his story over multiple films rather than making a, a film that he headlines. Not too sure whether that's just saying that he wouldn't be able to uh, make a movie that would sell as big as, as other movies would. But it does always feel like there's more of his story to come. It doesn't ever feel like anything has ended in the last couple of, couple of movies. But I really did like it in this movie. Ted Willers continues saying, I really disliked holes in the timeline and the five-year gap. Like I say, much more good than bad, but not quite the best of the bunch. Yeah, I think it's a, I mean, it is a tough call. Mm-hmm. A movie like this that wraps up 
22 other movies to an extent, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stretching back over 10 years. It, it's a significant piece of work to get that. Um, but I think it's great that ultimately, in the end, um, and I'd be uh, with you, there is so much more good than bad in this movie and mm -hmm. so much payoff. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely uh, great movie. Yeah. I think my biggest problem, really, I suppose, is as always, I want to see more of other characters. You know, they did a great job dealing with our main originals, but so many other characters that I wanted to see more of. They did a great job pairing characters off in the last movie that we you wouldn't expect to pair off in this movie because everybody comes back together at the end. You yeah. don't get as much of it, but it is it is there. I loved seeing T'Challa work alongside Spider-Man. That was really cool seeing those two characters together, people that haven't worked together before. Yeah, definitely. Um, de just really good seeing a lot of that stuff going on on screen, but really enjoyable film. Thanks, everybody, for your feedback. That's really good to hear your thoughts on the movie as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who's provided their feedback. It, as always, it's really good uh, to get your viewpoints uh, through. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, before we uh, sign off on this epic podcast, that you can subscribe to us over at tvpodcastindustries.com. Um, you can go to any good or evil uh, podcast catcher over on TV Podcast Industries. Of course, Defenders TV Podcast is also still live, so you can head over to DefendersTVPodcast.com as well to subscribe to the uh, podcast where we will have Marvel, Netflix, Jessica Jones Season 3 later this year. Mm -hmm. We're not entirely sure when that will be released, uh, but also uh, the Spider-Man Far From Home that is coming in June, and we'll certainly be back then, as well as Strange Tales intermingled uh, as they are released and um, we're a little bit behind on that but we will catch up uh, with these uh, in the near future yes the doctor strange comic books too, too behind i think at the absolutely moment, unfortunately but we'll get back to them i feel a bit naughty john having I done know. a spoiler filled discussion the opening weekend of uh, of avengers endgame having been told not to spoil it seeing things on social media with captain america going don't spoil it seeing people go Doctor Strange has seen this, the endings 14 million times and hasn't spoiled <laughs> yeah, anything for anybody. You know, I'm seeing him shush me when I, when I'm asking questions <laughs> or when I'm, when I'm explaining what happened in the movie. It but, looks, it looks like to me with the amount of money that this movie is making in its first weekend mm -hmm. that most people will have actually seen it. Yes. And so maybe it's not too bad. Exactly. Exactly. But thanks so much, fellow defenders, for joining us once again for our podcast about this movie. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the podcast and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, as always, uh, thank you so much for joining us, fellow defenders. It is a pleasure speaking to you. I'm off to go and, uh, well, hail Hydra. Uh, and after that, we'll be back to speak with you again soon. Bye. Bye. to the Endgame people Avengers Endgame movie review what? very deep it was a bit deep wasn't it <laughs> Endgame <laughs> we've entered the Endgame people it's Avengers Endgame movie review what? okay no I'm messing <laughs> I'm messing <laughs> Are you just doing his voice? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not doing his voice. He's been doing my voice first. Right, let's let's find out what they gave us, John, with your synopsis for the movie. Sure. I didn't, that's right. <laughs> well, John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for the movie? Sure. Bringing back Iron Man and Gamora. They, he's, she's the one that saved uh, Tony Stark from imminent whoa, death. Whoa, 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 Nebula. I always call her Gamara. Every time. Gamora is the green one. Yep. Oh, I know. I just I never, I never get Nebula, Nebula right. I just think they're both called Gamora. <laughs> Gamora 1 and Gamora 2. Oh, wait, always. It's terrible. And I love Karen Gillan as well. Anyway. Gamora A, failure. <laughs> <laughs> I love that we got Somerset Morn. Uh, sorry, Ebony Morn. Um Sorry, I just knocked the microphone. You were just wondering if you... <laughs> <laughs> You're right, yeah, they... 
Guys? Yeah, the dead man. We're here. Can you hear us? We're here, Chris. Sorry, we're trying to actually just say something without one of us talking over the other one. 